This is the In his left hand lies the blue pill, Neo's ticket to blissful ignorance. If he takes this pill, Neo will simply wake back up in his bed, believing in the nihilistic system that has brainwashed him, going back to his lonely, miserable, atomized existence, all while remaining ignorant to the true nature of the world. And on the other hand, sits the red pill. Taking this pill will grant Neo access to the matrix, allowing him to see the world for what it truly is, as nasty as it may be. This decision is the crucial point of Neo's story, and marks the first phase of Neo's hero's journey. I think it's worthless artificial. Within a decade, crypto and blockchain technology will be the 12th sector of this. as we know it, meaning the part we can all access. Much of the rest of the internet we call the deep web, which is just the part of the World Wide Web that's not indexed by search engines such as Google. It's a common mistake to think the dark web and the deep web are the same. The dark web is just a small part of the deep web. Many people give it the example of an iceberg. The bit at the top that we can see is the internet as we know it. The main part that lies under the water is the deep web, and the dark web is just a very small part around the very bottom of the iceberg. This is naturally where people go when they don't want to be found. That might be because they have a store there selling the aforementioned illegal substances, or it might just be because they're living in a country that has very oppressive laws on speech. In the dark web, you'll find sites that end with .onion. These websites are not accessible using your regular browser, but you can easily download the Tor browser, and before you can say, where am I, you'll be in the dark web. Here you should have complete anonymity. Ok, so the question is, should you go there? Well, firstly, you should know that the dark web, of course, is of interest to authorities. Illegal things happen there, so we can expect authorities to keep an eye on the place. You should also. You want to do a video on YouTube? Then you head to Amazon to buy your grandma's birthday present. This internet browsing is taking place on a level of the internet, the surface web. But beneath it are many more layers of the internet, what's known as the deep web. At the top of these layers are websites that can be accessed but can't be found by doing a simple search on Google or Bing. Think online banking and government databases, pages and a password. But what if you keep going down? all the way to the bottom of the deep web. Well here, you'll find the dark web. Here, users can communicate through encrypted messages and can buy and sell anything with total anonymity. It's been called the wild west of the internet because operating in the shadows are extremists, criminals and trolls. But where did the dark web come from and how does it work? Firstly, the dark web is not a place, but a term that describes parts of the internet that hide your identity and location. The dark web's infrastructure was created in the 1970s, at the same time as the internet itself. But to utilize it, you needed darknet software. Enter the US Naval Research Lab, who created, back in the early 2000s, one of the first and still the most popular darknet software, Tor. It was created for a number of reasons which included providing the US Navy's intelligence officers with the means to maneuver through the internet 
without being recognized or traced. So I've downloaded Tor, which looks like a normal web browser and seems to behave like one too. I can visit any site I like, but unlike normal web browsers, which would register my IP address straight away, the Tor browser bounces my request to enter the site via several computers around the world, encrypting and decrypting my identification as it goes, so that no one knows where the request has come from. Now that I'm browsing the internet anonymously, certain websites have become accessible. Websites like the infamous Silk Road. The Silk Road was one of the first online black markets where you could buy drugs, guns and child pornography. Two years after starting the site, the founder, Ross Ulbricht, was arrested in 2013 and sentenced to life in prison for money laundering, drug trafficking, hacking and fraud. This was quickly followed by a shutdown of its successor, Silk Road 2.0, along with similar sites such as Project Black Flag and Black Market Reloaded. There are even reports that the FBI has hacked into Tor itself, which subsequently saw the browser's usage drop by nearly 50%. This all gives the impression that the authorities are fighting back, but closing down one or two online markets has simply cleared the way for its competitors. If you didn't want to use the Tor browser, there's I2P or Freenet. Instead of Silk Road 2.0, there's now Dream, Agora or Alphabay, and they all provide the same services. The dark web, however, is not just an eBay for illegal purchases. It's also used by radical extremists to communicate and spread propaganda. But not all activity going on down in the dark web is illegal. Tor, for instance, receives 60% of its backing from the US State Department and the Department of Defense to act as a secure network for both government agencies and political dissidents fighting oppressive regimes. Over the past decade, the dark web has empowered activists to spread news during the Arab Spring and encourage whistleblowers to release information. The dark web as a tool to help journalists uncover the truth was made popular by Wikileaks. Now, news organizations such as the New York Times and The Guardian all host dark web drop sites for uploading anonymously leaked tips and documents. It's also helped domestic violence victims hide from online stalkers and allowed ordinary citizens to surf the web without being tracked by advertisers or even the government, which leaves us with a great dilemma. If the authorities try and succeed in shutting down the dark web, and the criminal activity that it supports, they'll also be adversely affecting all the people that use it for social benefit. The question remains whether internet freedom and privacy, for legitimate and sometimes life-saving reasons, are worth protecting while this vast criminal underworld operates alongside it, inside the dark web. These websites are not accessible via Google Chrome, Firefox or any internet browsers. Things which you are able to find by Googling or using traditional internet services are very limited. In fact, the average person has very little access to what is internet containing. There is a reason for that. There are things which we are not allowed to see. They show us only what they want us to see. But what if we were able to access the whole internet? What could we find there? Well, basically, we can buy anything there. Any information on governments, politicians, stolen bank accounts, illegal drugs, weapons, passports, stolen national identities. It's basically a place where people are able to exchange information without, without any censorship or, to, or third parties. In the media, the dark web is often portrayed as a dangerous place, but there are also legitimate websites on the dark web that doesn't necessarily pose any danger. Recently, I accessed the dark web because I was curious what, what kind of information I can find there. Well, among the most of the interesting things, I found websites with an entire list of Turkish national identities, stolen crypto wallets, banknotes where you can basically pay like 20 USD in Bitcoin and get shipped to like 1,000 worth of banknotes in cash. An example like this, we can see how worthless is our currency with just a piece of paper. If governments can print how much of it they want and it is considered illegal, why is it illegal then? That if the average person wants to print the currency in his grade, what's the difference? I don't see the justice here. But among 
The most interesting things which I found is this publication. It's called The Matrix, hidden from all the internet. So let's see what it contains. What is The Matrix? In my opinion, The Matrix films provide the best metaphor our society has for understanding why organized evil and oppression are allowed to exist, and so I will use it for this purpose. While my interpretation isn't the only possible one, I believe it to be valid, comprehensive, and most importantly, illustrative of the message I am trying to convey. So let's begin by discussing what The Matrix is not. The Matrix is not the physical world. As far as I am concerned, the physical world is actually real, and is in fact governed ceaselessly by the laws of physics. Conversely, the Matrix is also not the Internet, despite what many seem to believe. The Matrix stands and transcends both these worlds. It has existed since the dawn of civilization, and it will continue to exist until its collapse. So then, what is it? Well, that's complicated. Much like in the movie, it's nearly impossible to convey the size and scope of the Matrix to someone who doesn't already see it for what it is. However, unlike the movie, I believe it is an ethical imperative to try to convey it in a literal sense, even to those who are so dependent upon the Matrix, that they would fight to protect it. At worst, they would understand or believe, and will continue on about their business. In a sense, I believe Cypher was right to resent Morpheus for what he did, because Morpheus is the social structure, that subordinates humanity to its will. It is the machinery of society, that exists solely to perpetuate itself, its influence, and its power independent of any human need. It insulates us from each other and ourselves through deception, and essentially transforms us into servile engines of economic and political output, power. The machines that live off this power are our institutions. Large corporations, governments, schools, religious institutions, and even non-profit orgs. Every institution will reach a point in its existence, where its primary function becomes self-preservation and perpetuation, instead of serving human need. At this point it becomes a machine of the matrix. For example, when they become machines, governments cease to serve people and instead seek to extend their power over them, corporations prioritize increasing shareholder value over producing quality products or otherwise serving the public. Good, schools view students as a means, and not an end, religious organizations equate membership with salvation, and actively oppose other teachings, and even independent practice, and non-profits and charities spend more budget on fundraising activity than on their original focus. Inevitably all large institutions eventually become machines, they become too big for humanity. In addition to the independent self-perpetuating machines, that write most of our paychecks, the Matrix has several major cooperative, and more actively sinister groups of machines subsisting off of its power, and directly contributing to the structure of the Matrix itself. These groups are the military industrial complex, the political industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, the surveillance industrial complex, the media industrial complex, the academic industrial complex, the agricultural industrial complex, the medical industrial complex and major religious organizations, not to be confused with actual religions, many religious organizations have abandoned the underlying principles of the religions they claim to represent. All machines in these groups either actively oppress humanity, or enable the oppression to persist. It is through their combined efforts, that the Matrix takes on some of its more distasteful qualities. Do you ever wonder, if Aristotle and Plato dedicated their lives to something they don't really believe or tested? They had a school, a philosopher school. 2300 years ago and still today we have to learn at other universities. But why? If the things they said back then, were just thought forms without a deeper truth or meaning, why do we need to go so far back? How many opinions are there? Why are the opinions of them so important? That was my question. If you then take Karl Marx's book Dara's Capital, and you see his vision completely clashes with the visions of the ancient philosophers, not just little differences in opinion, but a way of thinking I call it a form of dehumanization, all in the name of capital, without shame. I wonder how this can be, because truth can be found in ancient philosophy, I believe in the laws concerning property and wealth, that Aristotle pointed out very strictly in his works. Why? Because the people he worked with were onto something. You don't do the things they did, if it's all without meaning. With the invention of money those laws could be altered, because the economy was since then not a trade of goods, but an economy based on money. Karl Marx was the front man of the shit. Money going to the digital age. Therefore maybe we should take Marx, and add it with the theory, to make it up to date. Marx it all matrix. He comes with the claim, that a worker should earn just enough to stay healthy, so that he can produce each day the same. In other words, the only reason we give you money is to stay working for us. 
producing. You can't earn too much money, because then you get lazy, just enough to see a show up each day, with the amount of sleep you need for your energy level to produce as much as possible. Nice philosophy he, full of ethics and deep human values. Then from with his utilitarianism philosophy comes into play, maybe we can do again a little game, because that's the trademark of certain organizations. Riddles and things hidden in plain sight. Utilitarianism equals illuminatorism, or how would you yourself name the philosophy based on the illuminati? Okay that's all speculation but look at the death of Aristotle, and combine it with the date of death of Bentham, the inventor of utilitarianism. Then we have 322 and 1832. Bentham's body was preserved, his head was mummified, but his body had to exist with bones, so no mummification. His head was missing. Why is that weird? And why all these facts? Because if you go to skull and bones you see only two dates 322 and 1832, a head and bones. When you study philosophy your book begins with 322 and ends with 1832 or the other way around. When you put these two philosophers together they don't mean much for each other, but when you look deeper, you will see that utilitarianism combined with Aristotle and Marx plus money in the form of a digital current provides the perfect blend to respect the natural laws of ancient philosophers by a form of energy transfer to money. Money you can give away as loan, you can invest it, by doing this, you don't have a big capital or any of the things that ancient philosophers protested against concerning natural laws. I don't know if having too much wealth capital has a negative impact on life. But Aristotle was convinced. The question is therefore, did Marx knew that he could pass the ancient philosophers with what he was writing? A strange thing to point to is the formula Marx used in his book MC MC MC. Some people say it's intentionally this formula to point to something else. Personally I think physics. Again something hidden in plain sight in the form of a joke to the initiates. This was a tip someone gave me. And indeed that is the humor of people that know things we don't. They love it when you see it right in front of you, but you have no idea. Utilitarianism stands for a society with the most amount of happiness. The goal is this the most amount of happiness, in order to base your decisions, and to say whether a decision is ethically and or morally correct. So when the most amount of happiness is achieved then ethics or morals are respected, it does not matter how many people are involved, and how the happiness is divided between the people. Looks great right? But if 20 people are just okay and one person is super happy, and this person is so happy, that the sum total of happiness is bigger than, when all 21 are all just fine then this is ethically correct, and morally a right thing to do. It's about sacrifice. It is allowed, that some people have to sacrifice themselves, as long as the total amount of happiness is the biggest. So who are these people who have to sacrifice themselves, and how many people are we talking about, do they know it about themselves? Can you see that people who are addicted to status, property and extravagance, the people who get the feeling that they are better than all the rest, that they own the world, that those people do reach a higher state of happiness compared to people that don't really care about a lot of property money, and do care about other people instead of own interest. Own interest is by the way the hidden hand from Adam Smith, hidden or invisible hand. But what does Aristotle say about all this? No man can have more than a certain amount of property possessions wealth. He is very strict and clear about these rules in his works. So do we have a problem? If the economy was based on exchange of goods there was indeed a problem, but Karl Marx and the banking system provide the solution. You take your money and you hand it out as loan, so you actually don't have a whole lot of capital, but each month you get a certain amount, that covers your big luxurious expenses. This way you escape Aristotle and Plato's advice on how life works, and the laws of nature on the division of property between the amount of people on earth. This way you escape the possible negative force when having too much, and you use Marx's theory on how to fully exploit your workers for your own advantage, meantime you give those workers loans, so you don't break the natural laws ancient philosophers talk about. And above all, these loans even give you more money, because of the interest. As if Marx's exploitation of workers isn't enough. They also have to pay interest on loans. But don't worry the utilitarianism way of life solves the problem it's all fucking ethical, and morally tolerable and accepted. 322-1832 Aristotle plus Bentham And all this is possible because of contracts, without legal agreement this would not exist. No loans, no investments, no labor contracts, the role of law and order is indeed very important. If money controls workers and money controls the energy of the workers, then money controls energy. If the stock market is based on money and money controls the workers then who is the stock? A good name right, funny right besides the hidden hand, has a far more important role to play than generally accepted. But they don't give us all the information. This whole text seems like a mockery, because it is a mockery. Why? Because that's the man they speak to us, amusement because of our lack of knowledge. The second reason is because the person who went back into Plato's cave was being mocked at. 
when people who know more than you mock you with riddles you don't understand, make sure that they think you are really dumbers. The riddles will become much more easy, because they think you are a stupid F degrees degrees K. Keep track of things, connect dots and see where the arrow points. By reading books random on good faith. We will not know the truth, but can only speculate. There are people who do know. When you meet people who treat you this way, you can become mad, or you can play the game. Smart people they mock them with harder riddles. So be a smart man, play a stupid muppet for the monsters, deceive them, manipulate them, study psychology, take the information, use the information, and let them become the puppets, while thinking they are still the masters. Because that's what they have done, and still are doing to us. And please don't ride a goat, take the bus. Resisting the Matrix. Resistance is a mental state. The Matrix is designed to make it easy to accept what it tells you, and to make it hard to filter the truth from the lies. Resisting the Matrix requires understanding its operating principles and assumptions, rejecting them, and helping others to do the same. The Matrix is fascist, the Matrix is deceptive, and the Matrix is bureaucracy. The Matrix is essentially the role of the institution over the individual, and in it, the rights of the individual, are subordinate to the rights of the institution. Individuals have to believe, or at least not actively oppose the idea, that large corporations have the right, to protect their profits above all else, and stick to policy and law. They have to believe, that this law is just, moral, and seemingly based upon reason, or, they have to feel unaffected by the law on an individual level. They have to accept the program, and be satisfied with the rewards given for doing so. They have to do their jobs, pay their taxes, and be content with their salary, at least to the point, where their salary and the stability it provides are appealing enough, to deter risking leaving the matrix. Rejecting these beliefs is the first step in resisting the matrix. Furthermore, people must be insulated from the creative process. They have to forget, that they are able to produce craft as individuals independent of large institutions, and they must feel entirely dependent upon the system, to provide them with what they need. It is mostly through the violation of this principle, that many who work with computers come to free themselves, or at least, come to see the matrix for what it is. Despite being products of the matrix, for the most part, computers and the internet enable humans, to create individual works on a global scale. Independent media, self-publishing, free open source software, computer music, computer art and graphics, and so on. Computers also enable independent people to communicate, and build human serving social structures outside of the matrix. However, note that computers aren't the only means of accomplishing this, and this time period isn't the first one of Exodus. In the 1960s, for example, people departed from the matrix and mass and independently created art, culture, and music, largely catalyzed by psychedelic drugs. Unfortunately, much of this structure collapsed due to a number of reasons, the main one being the hasty, ill-considered and unsustainable manner of its construction, and the subsequent institution and legal backlash. Miraculously, however, many of the core ideas have persisted, and their proliferation is largely the reason I am aware and able to write this document today. It would seem that the present catalyst is a combination of the internet and again psychedelics. Both of these phenomena provide a way of disconnecting yourself from the programmed reality and assumptions of the matrix, and taking your perceptions into your own hands. However, your perception is nothing but your individual dream that you have created as you have gone through life. There is the dream of the society that has been passed down generation after generation, and instilled into your mind by your parents, friends, schools, and institutions. And then there is your individual dream. Each step of the way in your life you have lived subjectively, and depending upon how and where you grew up, who you hung around with, and the habits you formed, you created your little dream. Your theory on life, while you stay completely unconscious of this. Everything that you think is you, I, me, and everything you believe, that you identify with is simply not you. It is not the truth. It is part of the giant web of individual dreams, that everyone is in the clutches of on our planet. This is one of the main reasons, why this world is the way it is, why it is so chaotic. You will scorn anyone who does not dream what you dream of, and someone will do the same to you. It is impossible for us to live the same individual dream, because we cannot know everything about each other down to your core. It is a constant fog that grows bigger and bigger, and more denser as each day passes. It is your ego, and it is my ego. The dream is not real. If we want to even begin to understand what it means, to exist as a human being on this planet and evolve, this truth must be learned, and it is just the beginning. Somewhere along the way, the entities that have been running the show figured out how the ego works, and they have been doing a damn good job of distracting us from time, to find a way out of our dreams and the dream of society. Psychedelics are simply a tool, but one of many to truly explore, and expand your consciousness. However, whether it be psychedelic substances or meditation, it is not the ultimate answer. It is simply showing you the door, but it is your choice, whether or not you want to enter into the other side. To persist, 
The matrix requires control, and in democratic societies it maintains this control, by filtering people's view of reality through corporate and mass media and television. In essence, the matrix requires a form of thought control, but not in the science fiction sense. Instead, it achieved an effective enough manner of thought control by manufacturing consent. The large majority of the public has to buy in. They have to believe that the news media gives them an accurate picture of the world. And by and large, they do believe this. Everything the general public knows about the world, they know through the matrix. The symbols and images the matrix presents to them have become more real than reality itself. Hence the popularity of the ungodly abomination, that is reality TV. Note that while some media outlets who actively promote a political agenda of domination and control, on the whole it is not through some grand conspiracy that this process, or any process of the matrix, functions. It is simply the way mass media is organized. Mass media is a machine that exists as a profit-maximizing entity, and the most profitable news, and cheapest news to produce, is recycled sound bites and prepackaged press releases from corporations and government. Furthermore, in the interest of preserving its revenue stream, news media cannot allow the public to hold any opinion that may threaten the authority and policy of government or the profitability of their sponsors, which are also machines of the matrix, and almost always directly involved in the business of domination and control, thus the media must perpetuate the status quo. No news is good news. Understanding this bias in the media is key to undoing the filter it applies. Consider who the advertisers and sponsors are. Beware of press releases disguised as investigative reporting. When possible, confirm mainstream, corporate produced stories with coverage from places like Indy Media, Go Local, Wiki News, GNN, Politic, Free Speech TV, Democracy Now, Free Speech Radio News, and Fur. A lot of the time these sources also cover many eye-popping items that for some reason don't even receive mention on corporate news media. Last, and most assuredly not least, The Matrix seeks to identify and know its members at all times, in this guided attempt to maintain control. It demands total surrender of your privacy to function in it. It is by breaking this last property of The Matrix, that we come to truly free ourselves from it, to create economies, communication, and culture independent of its control. Of course, the ultimate form of resistance is to fully disconnect from any and all dependence upon, and allegiance to government and institution, to remove yourself from the power structure of the matrix, and contribute your economic output to resistance economies. It is this form of resistance, that faces the most violent opposition from the matrix, since providing this economic power is the primary function of humanity, as it sees it. Unfortunately for many this form of resistance is simply unattainable due to family and social ties, especially starting from your first realization of the size and scope of the matrix. However, unlike in movie, it is possible to liberate yourself gradually instead of immediately, and in some cases this can prove easier than an all at once attempt. It starts with disconnecting. Cut out TV from your life entirely, especially TV news and reality TV shows. You should be able to get all your information and entertainment from the web, or from real reality, or from the occasional movie. Avoid chainsaws where possible, especially for food. Supporting smaller, especially sustainable, business keeps entrepreneurial and independent business spirit alive. Getting and staying out of debt, especially debt without equity, or rapidly depreciating equity such as car loans, is crucial, as debt is a primary mechanism the matrix uses to ensure your obedience. Also, if you are a salaried employee, working a 40-hour, or perhaps even 35-hour work week can be a big start to declaring your freedom from the machine, and the corporate American peer pressure to be a diligent slave. It also frees up huge amounts of mental energy which is then available for resistance. From here, a limited form of resistance whereby you leave the matrix for short periods of time, long enough to conduct purchases, business transactions, and communications with the underground, is well within the reach of all computer literate individuals. And functioning as a consumer is sufficiently supportive of the anonymous economy for it to be sustainable. Moreover, the probability of discovery of this sort of activity can be reduced as much as you choose. Doing this effectively is the subject of this photo. As you progress, you will notice yourself developing one or more separate identities, or pseudonyms. It is best to build as much insulation between these names as possible. They shouldn't appear to know each other, shouldn't really talk about the same stuff, or by the same things, and above all, should be diligently separated from your original physical identity. Maintain different wallets, bags, user accounts and possibly even computers. In short, develop one or more Tyler Durden's, except without all the insanity, self-destruction, and sociopathic behavior. Or with it, if it helps. The adept and the entrepreneurial will find it an easy step from here to total freedom. The next stage is to go into business for yourself. It doesn't have to be an anonymous business, but those who manage such an achievement do enjoy the satisfaction that they are directly subverting the matrix and helping to weaken its hold on everyone. Subverting the matrix. 
while resisting the matrix is an act of mental rebellion, subverting the matrix is an act of social revolution. It requires understanding the types of human communities that exist outside of the control of the matrix. It also requires understanding what sustains them, and if and how they directly or indirectly weaken the structure and control of the matrix. Once you understand this, it is possible to intelligently align yourself with communities that actively weaken the control of the matrix. Gift culture Gift culture, also known as free culture, or the gift economy, is a social structure where your status is determined by how much you are able to give away. It is not mutually exclusive to any other economic system, and examples of gift economies exist on top of capitalist, communist and socialist economies. Gift culture has brought forth some of the most astounding recent achievements of the human race, including the scientific research community, much of the World Wide Web, the entire open source movement, vulnerability, and security research, and Wikipedia, just to name a few examples. Gift economies tend to function best in the digital world, where something can be given without reducing the inventory of the giver. However, the Burning Man project is a massive experiment in bringing gift culture back into the physical world, and quite successful at that. Well over 35,000 people populate Black Rock City in the middle of the desert every year to give as much as they can to each other. The event serves in part as a model for the time when energy becomes abundant and human beings are capable of interstellar space travel. Obviously the burning of the man is the climax of the event. This is no small coincidence either. Gift culture does subvert the primary mechanisms of the matrix. The matrix subsists by transforming human endeavour into economic output which it uses to maintain its control. Gift culture, on the other hand, releases human endeavour for the good of all who would receive it. When items are given instead of sold, the power and control obtained through ownership is eliminated. Furthermore, in the case of open source software, the fact that full freedom over the source code is also given means that code that the matrix would never willingly create is readily available for the purposes of this hotel. It is interesting to note that even machines of the matrix are motivated to participate in gift culture, especially in the open source movement. It benefits many corporations as well as governments to have a common reference platform upon which they can build their individual products and infrastructures. Their cooperation in building this common platform vastly reduces the cost they would have paid to develop their own platform in-house, and is also inevitably cheaper than paying a single entity to do the same. The combined experience and widely distributed expertise, as well as the flexibility of modifying the common platform to perform a wide variety of tasks, yields a better system for all, and cheaper. In the digital world where copies are free, capitalism compels gift culture. Unfortunately, some companies, such as Amazon.com, reap tremendous benefits off of open source software, yet have a company policy of zero contribution back to the community. Other symptoms of this problem include Microsoft's war on the security research community and the tendency of even state-funded university professors to refuse to provide open source reference implementations of their work. There are mechanisms discussed in this hotel that enable this trend to be reversed, which leads us nicely into the next cultural segment, information anarchy. A closely related social structure to gift culture is information anarchy. The idea behind information anarchy is that all information should be as widely and freely disseminated as possible. The cultural ethos is vehemently at odds with intellectual property and refuses to recognize any such law or suffer any code that abridges free exchange of information. Needless to say, the machines of the matrix don't take too fond of you on this ideology. Unlike gift culture, which is an indirect subversion of the mechanisms of the matrix, information anarchy directly challenges the matrix's perceived right of ownership of human ideas. The past decade has seen an unprecedented decline in the freedom of information due to some of the more rabid elements of the matrix. The machines of the matrix now draw tremendous power from ideas and digital content information. Recent examples include the DNCA, extension of copyright duration, the harsh criminalization of copyright infractions, and the resulting side effects which lead to the criminalization of certain forms of technology. The legal climate for free speech and innovation has never looked darker. However, hope is not lost. The future looks so dark precisely for the reason that information anarchy poses such a grave threat to a major power source for so many parasitical machines. On some level, the Matrix knows its hold is tenuous. At every opportunity, the Matrix will tell you that protecting intellectual property encourages creativity. It has even developed an amusing array of propaganda to promote this idea, even going so far as to begin the brainwashing at an early age. Yes, the National Counterintelligence Executive is in fact a office of the US government, apparently one of its major propaganda arms. Their stuff is hilarious. I recommend printing some out at your local copy shop before it becomes classic. All of this nonsense is observably false. Societies have always been most successful when communication and ideas were open to all. 
It is important to remember that the world didn't always operate this way. It was only when the ruling elite of the Matrix realized that ideas and creative expression are easily converted to economic power that they took claim over them. Economic systems can and will adapt to a form that is more profitable for human creators instead of their machine owners. Five chapters of this hotel are devoted to protecting your digital identity and are easily applicable to contributing to the goal of information anarchy and providing even more economic incentive to move towards alternate revenue models and or gift culture. In every opportunity possible, do not support the system of intellectual property that the Matrix has created. Naturally as its power wanes, it will become weaker and less relevant as content creators seek their way through other means. The cancer starves and dies. So as of late, a major source of the erosion of civil liberties stems from the fact that casual economic transactions are becoming increasingly difficult to conduct without permanent, identifiable information being associated with them. With the advent and increase in the volume of internet commerce, casual purchases of personal items, books, software, and even medication are now irrevocably tied to your own personal identity. Bookstores such as Amazon now build complete dossiers of sorts on their customers' reading habits, and much of this information is available publicly. As a result, the natural reaction to these circumstances is to find methods to make internet commerce behave more like physical commerce, where you have the option of anonymity by using cash or cash-backed identity-free payment methods, an anonymous internet economy. The Matrix is providing massive economic incentive to create this economy as well. It has recently been revealed that the FBI writes over 30,000 national security letters in the US each year. Consider how easy it would be for them to demand records of everyone at Amazon who might like to buy a particular book, or who has ordered indecent materials from websites. Amazon already does classification of consumers' interests for marketing purposes. Their engine can perform this classification instantly. What would they have to say about what books you like to read? How about Google and the types of AdWords sites you are typically presented on the search website via mail? Google and many other search engines maintain indefinite logs of who searches for what keywords, along with lots of other data. These are prime targets for national security letters or just general government subpoena. I provide the basics for conducting anonymous transactions cheaply in Vixen this section. You can use these techniques to get yourself started and comfortable with interacting with the Matrix anonymously. From there, the entrepreneurs in the audience may wish to start a business, to start making some money in this new economy, and begin to fully escape from the control of the Matrix. Markets of interest might include items in online games, anonymous web hosting, certain types of medicine, or even illegal electronics. For example, many people are too lazy to build a myth box, but personally I sure as hell would buy one over a crippled and ad infested Ivo subscription service any day, if I watch TV, that is. As you can see, most of these things go on above ground today, but for how long? And why at such high risk for consumers living in less accepting legal climates? What about those who would pay more for more protection? For example, some customers may be attracted simply to the ability to free themselves from marketing and government profiling. Those who purchase certain types of books might prefer if Amazon and whoever else didn't have this information tied to their physical identity. Yet another possible white grey market to tap might be a physical anonymous remailer service for people who would like to conceal their street address from someone mailing them something in order to avoid becoming listed in a database for marketing spam and or to avoid general profiling and surveillance or to be able to order a product that won't normally ship to their geographic location. Basically the way the system could work is through a website where you create a temporary account number or unique pseudonym. The package is then shipped to a relay point where the account number pseudonym is read off and a new label printed onto the package. It is then mailed to its new destination and any electronic and paper records are destroyed. It also has the advantage that extremely paranoid users can potentially chain multiple locations together for extra security, so that competition does not necessarily compete for market share, but instead cooperates for it. You might consider marketing this as a virtual office solution to avoid liability, if done above ground. A useful technique for verifying that packages have not been opened examined en route is to create a unique multicolored wax seal or swirl using two or more candles, photograph the seal, and transmit the photograph electronically via encrypted email. Delivery payment can be ensured using normal upspeed SSP tracking numbers, which can be encrypted to the sender's public key and then destroyed. The demand for such a system might not be immediately visible now, but once the next Patriot Act 
or similar legislation removes all anonymity from the mail, the demand should skyrocket. This business has the advantage that it is extremely low setup overhead, and is very easy to start small with low capital, just to test market demand. Once the business is proved worthwhile, FedEx and possibly other major carriers offer bulk shipping rate accounts to merchants, that could be taken advantage of, bringing the overhead working cost to your customers potentially very low. Taking this idea a step further yields a ghost walker contract market, much like the ones described in fixed metal with a private digital economy. Most of the P2P token based nonsense there can be ignored, but this key idea could be transferred to your eBay like auction site. Basically the idea is that people would contract the services of someone who is killed at staying off the radar to conduct transactions, that for various reasons they do not want linked to their identity. Again, buying books, vitamins, medicine, regionally available items, web hosting, illegal electronics, and so on. Sort of like the inverse of a private investigator, these people would do anything from purchasing items, mailing, and delivering packages, and donating to charities, acting as couriers, business agents representatives, mail forwarders, and so on. This can already be carried out in a guerrilla fashion on community local city classified ad servers such as the nearly universal Craigslist, where it is possible to contract people from different state and country jurisdictions quite easily. In the ideal situation, a dedicated website would be created. Each ghost walker would have an end, possibly paying a fee to do so, both to support the site and to discourage more things, complete with ratings and reviews, prices but ask risk factor, and so on. Contracts would be posted by clients containing a generic description of the task, and interested ghost walkers would contact the buyer with prices. The buyer would then select a particular ghost walker to reveal the complete details of the contract to, and terms of payment. Given the tendency to increase total surveillance, lots of regular people may be interested in using this service. So there are numerous markets that can be potentially very lucrative while at the same time helping to build a social structure independent of domination and control. In general, any mechanism of state control creates markets for equipment or components that can be used to circumvent this control. Keep your eyes open for opportunities. If you have any suggestions or ideas, please feel free to contact me, so that I can update the hotel for all to benefit as we work together to free ourselves. Freedom seekers are not terrorists. Essentially this hotel represents the hacker community truly claiming independence for itself from national and institutional rule. While many of the ideas and techniques present in this document can be found elsewhere, I believe this is the first time such a coherent, consistent, and focused collection of these ideas has been assembled for a single purpose. 17 years ago, we made our Declaration of Independence. This body of code law represents a manner of constitution of cyberspace. A basic set of rights we claim for ourselves through our use of technology. Because the accusation will inevitably be made, I would just like to emphasize the distinction between freedom seekers and terrorists. The type of resistance and revolution discussed here is non-violent, and singularly focused upon allowing an individual to have real freedom through privacy and anonymity. While reactionary individuals might argue that the knowledge presented in this hotel could aid actual terrorists, the reality is they've already had much better training which has proved to be quite effective in practice. Furthermore, we're talking about people who are willing to give their lives in their quest. People whose families, friends, and their own lives have already been destroyed by empire. These people will stop nothing. They don't need this hotel to create new identities for privacy purposes, when perfectly valid ones can be stolen readily. Nor do they care much about surveillance, since surveillance can't stop a suicide mission. What's worse, is that on some level the police state must know this. Even being generous with the reasonable doubt, all evidence seems to indicate that at best it simply used the tragic events of September 11 as an excuse for a long-awaited massive power grab, with the resulting legislation doing far more to target the average citizen than any particular terrorist network. I recently had a discussion on Newsnet where it was asserted that taking action to protect yourself and withdraw from the matrix might generate even more excuses for introducing oppressive legislation and policy. I believe this will not be the case, and that moreover this thinking is in fact defeatist and even dangerous for a few reasons. First, the matrix will not and cannot overtly fight this behavior, as any public attention given to it will only provide it with more energy and momentum. The matrix media filter won't even allow the individual pieces of information that lead to the conclusions of this introduction to be discussed for this very reason. There is no way it would willingly publicize this ideology in its entirety, even to attempt to attack it. Furthermore, there is no need to. The matrix already has more than enough material to drive through as much oppressively restrictive legislation as it likes in the name of fighting giddy porn, the war on drugs, the war on terror, and in the name of protecting corporate profits. As stated above, it is already taking full advantage of this fact to all your ends. 
The interesting phenomenon is that the more ridiculous the regulations become, the more commonplace it will be for the public to want to circumvent them, which only serves to strengthen resistance economies. Second, if you look at all of history, freedom has never been given to a populace. Left to its own devices, the state only ever grows more powerful, it never surrenders power over citizens freely. Take any instance in history, where people have established rights for themselves, and you will see it was the result of a long, drawn-out battle, that the state simply lacked the resources, to continue to fight effectively. Prohibition wasn't abolished, because people acted good, honest and sober, it was because they got falling down drunk and alcohol consumption soared to new heights, while the Puritan state was powerless to continue to oppress the newly criminalized middle class. Likewise, civil rights weren't won, because Africans obediently stayed in their designated roles, complicitly accepting separate, but equal facilities and politely tolerating discrimination. It was because they practiced civil disobedience and active resistance against injustice. I believe in civil disobedience, and more importantly, the clear distinction between morality and law. I believe that it is defensive, defeatist thinking to say that, if we just be good, they will reward us and repeal laws. The laws, the Dunkar, the Patriot Act, the Reload Act, recent Supreme Court decisions and the now entirely conservative dominated court are already essentially fascist, and will only continue getting tougher in crime and terror. Stripping away the rights of citizens in the name of safety with little real gain except the hoisting of that floating eye on the dollar, but ever higher above the base. The total surveillance state has been a goal of the current cabal for time out of mind. Third and finally, once again I am not advocating violence here, or even any sort of crime, that has a victim. I'm advocating creating a social and economic structure based on anonymity, not necessarily illegality, that reigns the corporate state of power, and sweetens its ability to enforce fascist law and practice. In my view, the only thing that will cause the state to rescind is the realization that much like in the 1920s with prohibition, it has criminalized a vast portion of its population, that it is now powerless to control, and furthermore that its fascist law has done nothing to safeguard against the true monsters that its foreign policy has created. Continuation on its current course of action will lead the matrix to experience ever-increasing instances of identity theft, repeated infiltration of data warehouses, massive underground surveillance rings, and so on. These actions are not advocated in this photo, but they will inevitably become more commonplace as the matrix continues to make it easier to steal an existing identity than to create a new one, or otherwise escape from ceaseless surveillance. At this point in time, the matrix faces two options. It can either choose to allow us to be free, and create official sanction means for people who wish to free themselves from endless surveillance and total control to operate anonymously within the system. Or it can choose to fight war after costly war on civil liberties, and basic human rights until enough people are fed up with its behavior, that they begin to depart en masse. Again. But we already know the choice the Matrix will make. Already I can see the chain reaction of propaganda, the soundbite media precursors, that trigger the onset of an emotion, designed specifically to overwhelm logic and reason, an emotion that the Matrix will use to blind the masses from the simple and obvious truth. We are going to be free, and spreading the word. Initially I had planned for a small distribution of this document to only a select few, to attempt to stay under the radar. But as I indicate above, I now realize that is a flawed approach. Much like in a mixed network, the more people working to protect themselves and their identities, the better off the end result is. The stronger the support economies grow, the better able the resistance is to function autonomously. An ERC friend of mine has designed some fix and slick business cards that can be distributed at functions, protests, or wherever. Online print shops will typically print 200 500 of these for around $20. If you're itching to give me some kind of donation for some reason, you can direct your funds towards that instead. It even works on a sliding scale. For example, you can buy some sticker paper for like $5 at your local office supply store and print out some stickers to put up at coffee shops, clubs, bars, internet cafes, bookstores or anywhere intelligent people might be able to jot down or quickly visit a row. If anyone wants to create another design, send it to me, and I will post it here also. Target audience. This document is written at a technical level appropriate to car users, people who like to tinker with their computer configurations, to get the most out of their experience. Novice computer users who are uncomfortable tweaking settings, editing configuration files, and occasionally using the command line probably will struggle with much of the material regardless of OS. Unfortunately, though at least one person has offered to help elaborate the more technically involved sections to help novices along, we'll see how that lands up. I try to be as operating system agnostic as possible, providing information for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, but due to the open and readily customizable nature of the system, the Linux material probably will be the most well-developed. 
As far as demographics, I expect this document to be useful to a wide variety of people from several walks of life. In particular, some of the major categories are Civil Libertarians Those who are concerned with the gradual erosion of their personal freedoms will probably find nearly the entirety of this document useful and interesting, since it is intended to provide techniques and countermeasures to restore nearly every right that has been lost due to the wars on drugs, comma, porn, and terror. It is now possible for the anyone, the US government, frivolous civil litigants, PIs, and so on, to enumerate just about everything in your home without many warrants, simply by subpoenas or our national security letters. Somehow I doubt this situation was exactly what the framers of the Constitution had in mind. This document can help you to keep as much of your personal belongings and reading habits actually private and out of numerous commercial databases, which are readily available to law enforcement. Whistleblowers Whistleblowers who are interested in exposing wrongdoing, corruption, cover-up, or conspiracy at their workplaces will find this document useful for protecting their identities while contacting the press or otherwise disseminating evidence over the internet. When you are jeopardizing your job, and possibly your life, to expose wrongdoing, you must assume that no institution will be able to protect your identity from someone who is determined to silence you. Your only option is to make sure no one knows who you are in the first place until such time as your safety from retaliation can be guaranteed. If followed carefully and diligently, this document will show you how to accomplish this. Bloggers and independent journalists Similar to whistleblowers, bloggers and foreign posters often find themselves the target of harassment, especially when reporting on controversial material, or even when people who comment on their pages choose to do so. While it has recently been ruled that bloggers are afforded the same rights and protections as journalists, in cases where the blogger is exposing corruption or negligence at their workplace, additional measures of protecting oneself may be desired. In some cases, it may be desirable to publish pseudonymously simply to avoid the stress and expense of having to deal with frivolous lawsuits such as these political dissidents and inquisitive minds. Forget about China, even in the USA it's no secret that the spy has consistently harassed those who have dared to speak out against the status quo. Targeted groups include vegans, Catholics, Quakers, peace activists, environmental volunteers, third-party candidates and campaign workers, independent journalists and bloggers, and even members of the mainstream press. What should be most disturbing to the average citizen is how easily it is to become mistaken for one of these troublemakers simply for buying, or being recommended, the wrong book on Amazon, posting on the wrong blog, buying certain types of food on a credit card, and donating to certain charities etc. With the advent of aggressive data mining and aggregation, it is all too easy to be lumped in with the wrong crowd. If followed properly, this document will help you to retain your freedom to investigate alternative views and information without leaving an electronic trail of this activity to open yourself up to harassment. It should also help you minimize the damage a determined spy agent or vindictive ex-spouse or other enemy who has hired a pirate is able to do to you, people with enemies. As hinted at above, it's not just dissidents who need to be concerned either. Surveillance and draconian law can be used as dangerous weapons. All it takes is for one motivated enemy to hire a pie with access to the major data warehouses to dig into your life, find something that they can use, and then phone and report you, or simply blackmail you. Anyone with a vindictive ex-spouse, political adversary, or even a feuding neighbor can be the target of this abuse. Programmers and security researchers Due to the concurrent insanely broken patent law, programmers have found their freedom of speech horrendously restricted in the USA. Many security researchers have been afraid to discuss the privacy implications of copyright protection technology that is essentially spyware. Others are afraid to publish vulnerability assessments of cryptographic systems that may be tangentially related to copyright infringement or even simply software in general. This document can teach such programmers and researchers how to conceal their identities and versus as peers who are operating in legal climates that still respect the freedoms of speech and innovation. You can hire hackers here. HTTP N7L53 Onion the Video Game Underground. The Gnagar has also been used to harass video game hackers and cheaters. Some gaming companies will ban you from their online services if they discover your involvement or subscription to cheat forums. Most will not hesitate to issue bogus and car takedown notices to cheat mod websites that operate in the user. Software that modifies online games to provide additional features, cheats, or automation is also the target of car harassment. Furthermore, programmers who publicly reverse engineer and re-implement open source game servers find themselves the target of lawsuits. This document should assist these people to continue to play and modify games how they see fit without fear of persecution. Moonlighters, double shifters, and consultants. In a similar vein, those who are working multiple jobs may wish to conceal this fact from their employers due to fear of retaliation. 
I expect the most typical use case of this document will be programmers working as consultants or who wish to contribute to open source projects in their free time. Potential victims of identity theft, everyone. This document can also help those who are interested in protecting their identities and or financial information from being stolen due to their commerce online and elsewhere. As mentioned above, data warehouses such as ChoicePoint are essentially making identity a commodity. It is inevitable that this data will be leaked and stolen again and again. With identity becoming an increasingly integral aspect of functioning in society, black markets that sell this data will continue to be extremely profitable. Just like the war on drugs, the war on terror fought through the politics of domination and control will lead to ever escalating levels of waste, destruction, and chaos. The best way to protect yourself is to minimize your digital footprint. Use anonymous forms of payment online, and conceal your name and mailing address. Entrepreneurs. The last major category of people who are likely to find this document useful are those who are interested in providing privacy and anonymity services and software to others. Privacy and anonymity are difficult problems. There are many holes to be filled in, usability issues to be addressed, and markets to be built. To this group of people, every privacy problem and legal restriction should represent a potential market to get involved in. However, do not sell snake oil. If you cannot stand up to legal or other pressure, you need to inform your users of this fact clearly, so they are sure to take appropriate precautions while using your service, especially if you are located within the user. Very few, if any, privacy services are capable of operating a standalone one-shot solutions. What is needed is a series of tools and components that can be combined arbitrarily. Focus on one component and do it well. Markers Patrol. Retrieve from. This page was last edited on 31 October 10th, an expense of having to deal with frivolous lawsuits such as these. Forget about China, even in the USA it's no secret that the FI has consistently harassed those who have dared to speak out against the status quo. Targeted groups, HTTP, whitelist, include vegans, Catholics, Quakers, peace activists, environmental volunteers, third-party candidates and campaign workers, independent journalists and bloggers, and even members of the mainstream press. What should be most disturbing to the average citizen is how easily it is to become mistaken for one of these troublemakers simply for buying, or being recommended, the wrong book on Amazon, posting on the wrong blog, buying certain types of food on a credit card, and donating to certain charities, etc. With the advent of aggressive data mining and aggregation, it is all too easy to be lumped in with the wrong crowd. If followed properly, this document will help you to retain your freedom, to investigate alternative views and information without leaving an electronic trail of this activity, to open yourself up to harassment. It should also help you minimize the damage a determined by agent, or vindictive ex-spouse or other enemy who has hired a pi is able to do to you. As hinted at above, it's not just dissidents who need to be concerned either. Surveillance and draconian law can be used as dangerous weapons. All it takes is for one motivated enemy to hire a pi with access to the major data warehouses to dig into your life, find something that they can use, and then phone and report you, or simply blackmail you. Anyone with a vindictive ex-spouse, political adversary, or even a feuding neighbor can be the target of this abuse. Bloggers and independent journalists. Political dissidents and inquisitive minds. People with enemies. Due to the concurrent insanely broken patent law programmers have found their freedom of speech horrendously restricted in the user. Many security researchers have been afraid to discuss HTTP, W, HTML, the privacy implications of copyright protection technology that is essentially spyware. Others are afraid to publish assessments of cryptographic systems that may be tangentially related to copyright infringement or even simply software in general. HTTP, WWW. This document can teach such programmers and researchers how to conceal their identities and the CSS peers who are operating in legal climates that still respect the freedoms of speech and innovation. You can hire hackers here. The Dengar has also been used to harass game hackers and cheaters. Some gaming companies will ban you from their online services if they discover your involvement or subscription to cheat forums. Most will not hesitate to issue bogus and car takedown notices to cheat mod websites that operate in the user. Software that modifies online games to provide additional features, cheats, or automation is also the target of car harassment. Furthermore, programmers who publicly reverse engineer and re-implement open source game servers find themselves the target of lawsuits. This document should assist these people to continue to play and modify games how they see fit without fear of persecution. In a similar vein, those who are working multiple jobs may wish to conceal this fact from their employers due to fear of retaliation. I expect the most typical use case of this document will be programmers working as consultants or who wish to contribute to open source projects in their free time. 
This document can also help those who are interested in protecting their identities and or financial information from being stolen due to their commerce online and elsewhere. As mentioned above, data warehouses such as ChoicePoint are essentially making identity a commodity. It is inevitable that this data will be leaked and stolen again and again. With identity becoming an increasingly integral aspect of functioning in society, black markets that sell this data will continue to be extremely profitable. Just like the war on drugs, the war on terror fought through the politics of domination and control will lead to ever escalating levels of waste, destruction, and chaos. The best way to protect yourself is to minimize your digital footprint. Use anonymous forms of payment online, and conceal your name and mailing address. Programmers and security researchers. The video game underground. Moonlighters, double shifters, and consultants. Potential victims of identity theft, everyone. The last major category of people who are likely to find this document useful are those who are interested in providing privacy and anonymity services and software to others. Privacy and anonymity are difficult problems. There are many holes to be filled in, usability issues to be addressed, and markets to be built. To this group of people, every privacy problem and legal restriction should represent a potential market to get involved in. However, do not sell snake oil. If you cannot stand up to legal or other pressure, you need to inform your users of this fact clearly, so they are sure to take appropriate precautions while using your service. Especially if you are located within the use of very few, if any, privacy services are capable of operating as standalone one-shot solutions. What is needed is a series of tools and components that can be combined arbitrarily. Focus on one component and do it well. Template colon matrix dub revision as of 1332, 10 January 2016 contents. I'm driving through rural Romania. I live in a country which is rural, rural, very rural. And I'm going to a part of Romania which is extremely rural. And people often ask me, hey, did you move there to get off grid? Because they have this idea that if you go far enough away from the cities and you're off grid and you're safe from the new world order. And I always contest this point and make it very, very clear that I protect myself from the new world order by being on lots of grids at the same time, by having lots of passports, lots of companies, lots of trusts which own assets, lots of bank accounts, lots of residencies. I live in many, many places. It's very difficult for anyone to track down and say exactly where is my life. No one government controls my entire existence and ban me from driving. It's very, very hard to control me because I put myself on a bunch of grids. The idea of going off grid is old fashioned thinking and it's outdated. But when discussing this, people often talk about the New World Order, and the New World Order has many various different definitions. Some people see the New World Order as the shadow cartel for the politicians. Some people see it as the Rothschilds or the Illuminati or the banking sector. It's very, very difficult to surmise what the New World Order is. But for me, I think the New World Order is very simple. I think the New World Order is the smartphone. I think the smartphone is the New World Order. So, it's charging. I think the smartphone's the New World Order. Why? Because they know who you talk to, they know what you say, they know what websites you visit, your banking app is on there, or Apple Play, uh, Apple Pay, so they know where you spend money, how much you spend, where your money comes from. They also know where you are all of the time. Like, what more could they possibly want? They listen to your conversation. How many times have you talked about something, banana smoothies, and then you're scrolling through Facebook a few minutes later and there's adverts for banana smoothie makers? And they go, we don't listen to you. Of course you don't. They listen to everything you say, they know where you are all of the time. So unless you're gonna quit having a phone, then you're always gonna be part of the new world order. Because the new world order is basically just controlling Google and knowing everything about everyone. And that's your phone. And we're all addicted and we're never gonna give it up. So let's stop pretending that there's a world in which you're gonna live without a smartphone. So I'm gonna prove to you something. Do you remember when you used to be able to take the battery out of your phone? Out of the back? All the old people like me remember that. But that's all ended now. You can't buy a phone in which you can do that anymore. And that's because even if you turn your phone off, they still listen to you, and they still know exactly where you are and where you go. People have this idea, this false idea that, ah, but if I have a password on my phone and the police can't get into the password, then my phone's safe. Listen, if the police know your phone number, and basically everyone who knows you knows your phone number, then they can tell which phone is yours, and then they know where you are all of the time. That's it. It's done. It's not complicated. So I'm going to prove something to you. So I've got an application here called Waze on my phone, which is a navigation application. And I am using Apple CarPlay. So Apple CarPlay is where your phone is here on your car. You can see it here. I have Spotify, Waze, Telephone. You can see it all here. The point I'm making is I'll put them side by side. The reason I'm doing this is to show you that the map on being displayed on my car screen is not the BMW's internal uh, navigation system. This is a direct reflection of my phone. 
waves on my phone, waves on, on the BMW. Apple CarPlay, very, very simple. If I turn my phone off, the map on the car should stop updating, or it should crash, it should close completely, because it's a reflection of my phone's location, and my phone's no longer on. So let's test exactly that, shall we? I've got my phone here, and I'm powered off. It's been a long time since I turn my phone. Turn off, slide the power off, off. So now that my phone is off, it shouldn't be broadcasting its location anywhere. Why would my off phone broadcast its location or listen? Why would my off phone uh, be allowed or able to stay connected with a BMW and a BMW entertainment system to show my location on a screen when it's powered off? Why is it updating in real time? That's a reflection of my phone's location. My phone is off. So turning your phone off doesn't change. You can't stay it will still know where you are. It will still listen to you. Let's play updates. This is literally, it's updating in real time. My phone is off. Everyone who doubts me, I'm going to turn it back off. One phone, don't pretend you're not on. Oh, now you're powering up. Oh, you're powering up. You've already, <laughs> you've already been on enough to broadcast to my BMW. This is the BMW M5 competition. Then it wants to repeat the test. New World Order. You cannot escape. You are a peon, a slave. As long as you have one of these phones, you're a slave. They know where you are, they know what you say, they know where you spend your money, and they will, they will blast you with advertising until the fact you, until the point you say something they don't like, and then they will put you in jail for some garbage, with some subjective law and a legal system which is corrupt, bought, and paid for. And as long as, and if you're sitting there thinking, well, if I move to, out into the woods, if I move to Montana, I'll be fine. Not if you have a phone, you won't, and you need a phone to live. I am in rural Transylvania, and I can't escape being a smile. So the document basically ends here. After quite some search, I was able to find this next part, which you can read here if you want. After finding the next part, I realized that it's basically a whole book about system, privacy, freedom, and anonymity. The book detailed describes how to escape metrics and how to disappear from government's reach, basically in all realms, in physical and virtual world. It contains detail how to create new identities, make pieces work anonymously, how to use anonymous phones. It's basically like a real-life blueprint book for secret agents, but in real life. This book has been taken down from everywhere, and I was really struggling to find it, even on the dark web, but I managed to eventually find it on some forum. I will post a link for a book under this video, so anyone has access to this information. I have no idea how old is this publication, but I found the mentions on the forum which was 11 years old. It's, for me it's completely mind-blowing that such a publication was created 11 years ago by, by someone so smart for seeing everyone, everything for its true nature and where is, where is it going to go. Because all the things described in this publication really happened. Everything about government control, secret society, everything come true. So this publication must be really old, I think it's at least 11 years old, if not more. But it's very mind-blowing that somebody was able to make such a publication. For what is worth, somebody really doesn't want us to find this book or use information provided in this book. Because it was basically hidden from everywhere. It took me really a lot, of time, a lot of time to find this book and information containing it. Person or group of people who created this publication was absolutely right in everything which he said 11 years ago, because this is exactly what happened. Private corporations and governments, they know everything about us through our cell phones. They know with, he, with who we are hanging out, they know our bank details, they know our bank accounts, our location, our interests, our information. They basically know everything about us through the cell phones. And it's going to get only worse, so be prepared. It's strange world we live in, but here are the things which you can really take from this to start escaping debt slavery based system.
greatest films ever made, hitting $460 million in just box office sales alone, and The Matrix was an instant hit. And after two decades, its relevancy continues to stand strong, with terms coined from the movies such as The Matrix and The Red Pool becoming widely adopted in modern culture. And yet even more interestingly, is that The Matrix is perhaps one of the most beautifully prophetic and meaningful movies ever created in history. So what is it about this film that made it so culturally important? How could this movie continue to be so relevant after 20 years? What was the movie tapping into? Well, this brings us on to the bedroom of a depressed, pasty software engineer, a nighttime hacker called Neo, who is slumped over in his trash-filled room, with the bleak film colouring resembling his nihilistic, empty, dull existence that Neo lives in. At the start of The Matrix, Neo is a nihilistic man. His corporate life, a monotonous desk job, makes Neo feel that his actions don't have any effect on reality. Small details in the film make this even clearer, with Neo's flat being numbered 101, a direct reference to George Orwell's book 1984. In Orwell's book, Room 101 was a torture room, where people would be shown their greatest fears in order to mold them in the state's ideal image. And Neo's life is lived inside room 101, where he is tortured by the routine and can't find any meaning in his life. So he seeks to find these answers through his double life as a hacker, but comes up empty every time. Whatever he does while locked inside the matrix has no meaning. But one day this starts to change, when he wakes up to find a strange message on his monitor, with the message telling him that the quote matrix has him and that he must follow the white rabbit. It seems as though this could just be another hacker getting back at Neo. This could all just be a prank. But then, the last thing the computer writes is knock knock Neo, just before somebody does exactly that on his door. And when Neo opens the door, he finds it's a group of people led by a man who wants to buy illicit information held on a storage device. Neo lets out a sigh of relief. This is business as usual. But after the purchase is complete, the group invites him out to the club. And right as he's about to refuse, Neo sees a white rabbit tattoo on the shoulder of one of the women. Realizing that this tattoo is part of the instructions sent by him on the computer, he accepts the invitation, knowing deep down that something is up. The decision to follow the White Rabbit is the first of many decisions in Neo's rejection of the Matrix, but he doesn't quite know this yet. And so when arriving at the club, Neo is approached by a woman named Trinity, who cryptically warns him of impending danger. Neo recognizes her name as a fellow computer hacker. However, she says that was all a long time ago. Trinity then talks to Neo about his general dissatisfaction with life, as she knows that Neo is aimless and tormented by a lack of meaning in his life. She knows that nihilism has sucked his soul. So she promises him that there will be an answer. Cut to the next scene and we see Neo waking up late for work and proceeding to get chewed out by his boss. But in the back of Neo's mind are questions. Was following the white rabbit just a dream? Who was Trinity? All while Neo continues his droney hollowed out existence, living like human cattle in an artificial box with artificial lighting, trapped inside a spiritual cage with all the other droogs. The crushing weight of his sterile existence makes Neo even more curious about the white rabbit. It's a glimpse of something different different. And just as Neo continues to stay stuck behind his cubicle, he is then struck by a call from a man named Morpheus. They're coming for you, Neo, and I don't know what they're going to do. Who alerts him that the danger Trinity was telling Neo about is real, and that Neo is being followed by agents. In a tense scene, Neo briefly evades some agents who have been looking for him, but Neo's mind is the only thing holding him back. And Neo is actually successful in escaping the agents. He's finally taking that call to adventure. He's choosing to take his life into his own hands. This is the start of Neo breaking free from his cage. But then he comes up against his biggest challenge, as Morpheus tells Neo that the only way he can escape the agents is to walk across the ledge. But his programmed mind just can't overcome this obstacle. He doesn't believe in himself or his abilities. He's been programmed to be comfortable. He's never been near real danger. So his strength, his mind and ability is hampered, causing him to refuse that call to adventure. And by refusing the call, this represents Neo refusing to tackle his fear. He knows he'll be successful if he overcomes his fear, and yet his weak, anxious mind is his biggest failure. His nihilism is what keeps him trapped in the matrix. And so Neo fails to succeed, resulting in him being escorted to an interrogation room. At first, Neo believes that he's being prosecuted by regular government workers. But when Neo demands to be given his rights, they seal his mouth shut, as if it was done by magic. They then implant a mechanical tracking bug into his stomach, meaning that Neo would now always be tracked in the matrix. He's an outlier, and outliers are the biggest threat to their society. And then just like that, Neo is back in his bed, again seeming like this was all just a dream. And yet somehow, Neo is immediately called again by Morpheus, who gets Trinity and some other crew members to pick him up. Before Neo meets Morpheus, Trinity removes the bug that is tracking him, proving to Neo that this wasn't a dream. From here, Neo goes on to meet his mentor, Morpheus, who's living inside an abandoned building. 
Morpheus confirms all of Neo's suspicions, telling him that his whole life is a lie and that he was born a slave to the Matrix. This was why he was so demasculated, becoming just another corporate drone. It was all by design. However, Morpheus then offers Neo a choice, the decision on whether to remain blissfully ignorant or learn the true nature of the Matrix. Similar to our own reality, nobody can really be told what the Matrix is. One has to experience it and find out for themselves. So Morpheus then opens up his palms, revealing the notorious red and blue pills in his separate hands. In his left hand lies the blue pill, Neo's ticket to blissful ignorance. If he takes this pill, Neo will simply wake back up in his bed, believing in the nihilistic system that has brainwashed him, going back to his lonely, miserable, atomized existence, all while remaining ignorant to the true nature of the world. And on the other hand, sits the red pill. Taking this pill will grant Neo access to the Matrix, allowing him to see the world for what it truly is, as nasty as it may be. This decision is the crucial point of Neo's story, and marks the first phase of Neo's hero's journey. The hero's journey is one of the oldest tales of mankind. It's a narrative structure that ranges from all kinds of stories, from Star Wars to the Bible. The term was coined by author Joseph Campbell. He describes this as being a deeply ingrained part of the human psyche that allows humans to push through walls and do the impossible in pursuit of meaning. In the real world, the hero's journey is our path towards self-improvement and overcoming our neuroticism, anxiety, fears and laziness. Which is why right now we're seeing this whole new wave of self-improvement, serving as a counterbalance to the nihilism that's embedded so deeply in modern society. But this isn't a modern thing. In fact, many forms of Buddhism gave a similar path to enlightenment, along with so many other religions. The hero's journey is a process that's been taken by all of mankind. It's every step out of your comfort zone that brings you further towards truth. It's every action that you take towards self-improvement, which brings you closer to unlocking meaning in your life. And it's one of the key things that the Matrix tries to show. We see this clearly when Neo takes the red pill and the world begins to melt around him as he soon wakes up in a nightmare situation. Upon opening his eyes in the real world, Neo almost drowns, trying to remove all the cables that are attached to him in a pot. Once he catches his breath and takes a look around, Neo sees the true reality of the world, a human factory farm. As far as the eye can see, there lies identical pods attached to enormous constructs, all of them containing other humans being harvested for their energy. When a robot suddenly sees that Neo has managed to escape his sedation, he is quickly discarded and thrown down a trash chute towards a pit filled with water. Luckily before drowning, Neo is picked up by the claw of a ship and is subsequently rehabilitated by Morpheus and his crew. When being operated on, Neo questions why his eyes hurt. Along with his extreme muscle atrophy, Morpheus explains the reason. Neo is in a full-on breakdown because he has never actually experienced any kind of bodily autonomy. Once Neo is brought to stable condition, he is plugged into a chair and enters the Matrix along with Morpheus, because Morpheus needs to show Neo the true reality of the Matrix. At first, Neo is in disbelief that he's inside a computer program, but Morpheus questions him on if this is actually so hard to believe. He explains that if what you can feel, smell, taste and see, then what constitutes as real is simply electric signals being interpreted by your brain. After this explanation, Morpheus reveals that the outside world is in an even bleaker scenario than the one inside their home base. He explains that after losing control of artificial intelligence, humanity decided to create a nuclear winter, believing that a lack of energy from the sun will eliminate the machines. After the nukes, the world became a wasteland, run entirely by machines, while humanity was trapped in a dream world. This dream world is the Matrix, a simulation of humanity's golden age. It is all-encompassing and never stops for the people inside it, where they live their whole lives believing that the Matrix is real. And if this wasn't heavy enough, Morpheus then springs it onto Neo that he believes that Neo is the reincarnation of a man with the power to change anything in the Matrix. He is the one. Sometimes mainstream media can be the biggest impediment to understanding the truth and keeping you stuck in our society's matrix. Which is why I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News shows you how breaking news is being covered across the political spectrum. They do this by gathering news from 50,000 sources around the world and puts all related articles in one place so you can easily compare coverage. By doing this, Ground News allows you to see the story behind the story. Using data-driven analytics, they look at things such as political bias, reliability, and ownership of news outlets. I mean, for example, check out the story about 1,300 channel migrants crossing the English Channel on one day. Not only can I see that there are 31 sources reporting on this, but I can also quickly identify which sources have a political bias, according to the ratings from independent news monitoring organizations. And what's interesting about this story is that it's mostly been covered by right-leaning news outlets, all with varying degrees of factuality. With Ground News, I can also check out the ownership of each of the media companies, seeing if they're controlled by governments, media conglomerates, or if they're independent news outlets. And this data is in 
valuable if you want to find the truth behind each new story. So go to ground news forward slash moon or click the link in the description below or the pinned comment to try ground news for free. We'll go subscribe to them to get unlimited access and support a small team of media outsiders working to make the news more transparent. Initially not taking things very well, Neo panics at his newfound enlightenment. He is realizing that the entire world around him, all his friends, memories, icons, dreams are all warped for the benefit of an elite minority. It's as though the Matrix was a warning, a warning about the path modernity is taking us, where technology has infested every aspect of daily life to a point that we've attached our own psyches into the hands of a few. You see, in our age of overconsumption and mass production, the powerful must maintain constant relevance through advertising and media. By doing this, multinationals always assure continuous demand to drive continuous profits. Instead of just manufacturing a particular product, companies need to manufacture the structure, the personality, the culture of the universal public. And Big Tech serves as the perfect vessel to do this. Every day of your life, Big Tech delivers you into an alternative reality, playing on your emotions, depression, fear, anxiety, hunger, lust, laughter, acting directly on your sensorium. The content you are constantly watching every hour of every day of every year is not a vision but a manual factored data stream that can be sanitized to impose cultural values that generate immense wealth. Little do we realize that every day we are chipping away our autonomy to an all-pervasive drug that delivers whatever message those dealing the drug wish it to be, providing a fertile ground for fostering technocracy. Which is why in the Matrix movie, this is symbolized by AI using human consciousness to fuel their ever-expanding empire. Neo realizes the challenge he is up against. He has to mentally and physically overcome the entire system he lived in to find true meaning, to save the entire human population. However, Neo's fears soon start to dissipate once he begins practicing and learning the inner workings of the Matrix. Back inside the program, Morpheus introduces Neo to a combat simulation inside of a dojo. This is a sparring program, similar to the programmed reality of the Matrix. It has the same basic rules, rules like gravity. What you must learn is that these rules are no different than the rules of a computer system. Some of them can be bent, others can be broken. Using a computer algorithm, Neo is able to completely understand the intricacies of Kung Fu, despite having never done so before. So Neo and Morpheus begin fighting. At the start, Morpheus is dominating. He seems unstoppable, he's flying across the room. And so when Morpheus asks why Neo lost, Neo explains that Morpheus is just too fast. But he counters this by saying that the fighting ability has nothing to do with their muscles. Cluing Neo in, Morpheus implies that Neo doesn't even need to breathe in air when inside the Matrix. So upon hearing this, Neo is able to overtake Morpheus during the second fight. He understands that the whole game is mental. If he can overcome the mental barriers inside of his mind, he can win anything. And by doing this, he stuns the whole crew watching the ordeal. This is all part of the trials and tribulations that Campbell identified in the hero's journey. It's the mental game that serves as the greatest barrier to success. This is the step that Campbell describes as the training and tribulations in his work. This step happens once the hero has entered into the unknown and serves as their introduction into the new world. For Neo, this is quite literal. The skills he will need are taught to him after he first exits the Matrix and goes back inside to train with Morpheus. Neo's teachings also bring Neo closer to the truth. The more he learns about the real world and the Matrix that he lived in, the more he experiences both of them, the further he is pushed towards the truth. Afterwards, Morpheus introduces Neo to another program inside the Matrix, one that holds everything that is expected in a real city, ranging from buildings to cars and simulated people. Morpheus explains that the Matrix is their enemy, but most people are not ready to be unplugged from it, as they are too dependent on the system. While listening, Neo's eyes are caught by a striking woman in a red dress. When she gets behind Neo, the woman suddenly changes into an agent, pointing a gun at him. Morpheus then reveals that these agents are in fact sentient computer programs fully capable of manipulating the Matrix at will. It turns out that everyone who has fought one of these agents was killed, but Morpheus, believing that Neo is the one, states that the agents will never be as strong or as fast as he can be. This dream world of the Matrix is a reflection towards fears of consumerism. You see, all these films in the late 90s were particularly concerned with this, as they saw their society become more and more focused on products and commodities. But nowadays, these fears are even more prevalent. The vessel of big tech dominates everyday life in a way that we've never seen before where human values have been chopped up and commodified for a profit, where our opinions, our values, our culture, our thoughts are all controlled by technology that has saturated everything. And the numbers show that this is increasingly leading us towards nihilism. Just look around you. The atomization, the loneliness, the depression, the anxiousness. Just as Neo's life in the Matrix made him nihilistic, to find meaning, we must continue our own journey. And the nature of the Matrix strikes a resemblance to the concept known as the habitus. The habitus is a sociological theory that tells us that from 
a young age, the social convention and rules that people follow are imprinted onto your personality. These conventions aren't just habitual, but instead influence people's ways of thinking and how they see the world. And once you become part of the habitus, your actions perpetuate the cycle for other people. The habitus can be viewed much like the rules of a game. Seemingly illogical things are taken for granted and enshrined as rules. If you didn't know the rules of golf, for example, the sport would just look ridiculous. Why not just pick up the ball and put it in the hole? But knowing the rules of golf means that you see this in an entirely different way. Of course, the rules of golf exist for a reason, otherwise it wouldn't be a natural game. But the habitus has no real purpose by itself. It exists as a manifestation of the environment you grew up in. So then who controls the rules and conventions that easily influence our thoughts? When you start to ask this question about your own life, you then start to see that once you break free of the constraints placed on you, that you can finally see the world as it truly is. And the matrix is the allegory for this. It exists as a prison that surrounds you entirely, dictating what you see, what you value, and what actions you take. But none of this is actually real. Once these conventions, once these values, once these rules are tainted too much, the cracks start to show. And in the matrix, the cracks show when Neo breaks free. This is Neo's journey, breaking free from the constraints of falsehood. It's only through his self-improvement and search for the truth that he can finally find meaning. It's during the time of Neo's training in the Matrix that we're introduced to the character of Cypher. From the very first conversation, Cypher complains that he should have just taken that blue pill and begins questioning the credibility of Neo's journey altogether. We then transition to the reveal of Cypher's endgame while he's dining in a restaurant inside of the Matrix, being joined by Agent Smith. Willing to sell out his whole crew, Cypher requests to be put back inside the Matrix. Of course, not without benefit. In return, he wants to be a rich, famous actor who doesn't remember anything about the real world. Here, Cypher's entire character is summarized as he states the line, Ignorance is bliss. Meanwhile, Neo, Morpheus, and some other members of the crew enter the Matrix to meet an important figure called the Oracle. Upon arrival, Neo sees a group of children who are all doing seemingly impossible things. A few are manipulating objects like bubbles and blocks using their minds, and one child even manages to bend a spoon right in front of Neo. Neo takes an interest in the child, who explains that trying to bend the spoon is impossible. One has to realize that there is no spoon. They have to use their mind to overcome impossible obstacles. Once Neo hears this, he looks at the spoon and is able to easily bend it with his mind, just before he's quickly called off to see the oracle. This spoon bending scene is important as it establishes the way out of the matrix. As you start to realize that everything in your life is determined by your mindset, your life really begins to change. And the change of mindset isn't only an internal change, but also an external one. The way you see the world actually changes it around you. In an abstract sense, we all create our own realities through through our experiences. The world is only made up of the data that our senses give us, and it's up to us to fill in the rest. In the movie, this is made literal. Neo can bend the spoon because he knows and accepts the truth that it's simply a figment of the Matrix, and in doing so, this puts him forward on his hero's journey. But because Neo hasn't fully accepted his journey, or fully understood the fact that he is the chosen one, the Oracle doesn't have good news for him, as she states that he really isn't the one. And once Neo is down receiving this bad news, Neo then gets a case of deja vu after watching a black cat repeat his movements. As soon as he says this, this indicates to the crew that there has been a glitch in the Matrix. It turns out that this whole visit was just a trap set up with the help of Cypher, and things start to go downhill from here, as Morpheus is then caught by Agent Smith, and the rest of the group flees to a nearby garage. As it's revealed that Cypher has backstabbed all of them, he then goes on to kill many of his crew, but it stops right before he can kill the chosen one, Neo. This too is part of the hero's journey. Campbell shows that one of the key steps in your hero's journey is facing someone who wants to bring you back to where you started. And in the Matrix, Cypher represents this. He's the guys you know who want to bring you down. He's the other crab in the bucket. People don't want you to succeed. They don't want you to escape the Matrix surrounding you. Because if you do, it shines a bad light on them. They know their flaws. They know their mindset is weak. Cypher's failed sabotage demonstrates the futility of a desire to go back to ignorance. And this is true for both our reality and the Matrix. Once the truth is uncovered, there's no going back. Which brings us on to one of the most interesting scenes in the movie, a dialogue between Morpheus and Agent Smith. Two equals and opposite sides of an extensive conflict between man and AI. Smith equates humanity to a virus, one that spreads exponentially while devouring all the resources in their way. And from the perspective of a machine, he isn't entirely wrong. Smith then clears his subordinates from the room and further levels with Morpheus. It turns out Smith hates the Matrix just as much as Morpheus, yet for very different reasons. Smith views himself as above it. Agent Smith represents the elite. He's the one who creates the Matrix. He hates the people inside of it. The people inside of it are the only ones feeding his life force. And yet he can't help but despise these people. These people who live in blissful ignorance of the horrible world around them. They have no idea what the truth is. They don't know the darkness of the real world. And by accessing the secrets that Morpheus holds, this will allow Agent Smith to completely destroy the last remaining bastion of humanity in the outside world, a place called Zion. But before Smith can extract this information, Neo and Trinity storm the building with multiple firearms, rescuing Morpheus 
Morpheus in the process. The trio made their escape through a phone booth as Morpheus exits the Matrix along with Trinity, but not before witnessing Agent Smith at the last second, leaving him alone with Neo. The two begin fighting, but Neo isn't able to keep up with Smith and is eventually shot dead. Back on the ship with Morpheus and Trinity, they watch Neo as all of this happens. Devastated, Trinity whispers into Neo's ear that she would fall in love with a dead man and that he is the one. As she kisses Neo, he is thunderously resurrected, almost in a biblical sense. This scene again is just another phase of the hero's journey, the point of deepest despair. It seems like all is lost as Neo lies unconscious, but when Neo makes the choice to save Morpheus, he begins the final steps towards his journey. His death and rebirth are literal, but they're also metaphorical. Mr. Anderson, the person with no purpose, the person who's nihilistic, the person who's self-hating, self-wallowing, living an atomized, transient, lonely life in a dystopian megacity, is gone. However, Neo is born. This sequence and what follows next is the conclusion of Neo's journey, where he faces his harshest challenge yet as he journeys into the government building to rescue Morpheus. In doing so, he becomes the one. He conquers his mind, and by doing so, Neo fulfills his hero's journey. He finally finds meaning in life. Neo defeats the nihilism surrounding him by accepting the truth around the world. And from Neo's perspective, everything around him is now computer code. He effortlessly flies into Agent Smith, obliterating him and causing his colleagues to run away. Once all said and done, Neo exits the Matrix and detonates an EMP securing the safety of his operation space back in the real world. The film then ends with Neo talking on a payphone, speaking directly to the audience. Neo sends a warning that he is going to expose the truth of what's really out there, and he proceeds to fly straight up in the sky as the film cuts to black. This end scene is an allegory of escaping nihilism. Through rejecting our fractured habitus and the false values of the virtual world, one can find meaning in reality. Among many, these consumerist forces we find today are distractions that drive people away from the truth. For the self-improvement and your own hero's journey, it's possible to escape the clutches of your own matrix. In the film, the bullets that would have killed Neo before simply stop in mid-air. In the same way, the things that seem like problems in the virtual world cease to matter when you stop focusing on them and pay attention to the real ones. This whole end scene is supposed to highlight the true power of overcoming our own mind, our own self-destructive thoughts, and our own self-limiting beliefs. By defeating his anxieties, Neo could defeat anything. It was only once he conquered himself that he could find transcendental meaning and overcome the impossible. Which is what this film is trying to show us, that when you realize that you have full control of your behavior, addictions, anxieties, relationships, health, and destiny, can you start to wake up from the delusion you've been living in? This is the only way of breaking through the matrix that has enslaved your life. If you frequent the internet, you have likely seen memes and videos with a character known as Doomer, and or any of his counter characters, Boomer, Bloomer, and Zoomer. If you have not, these are them. Each of these characters represents a distinct personality type, usually associated with a specific generation within current society. The Doomer character is especially popular, and is what we will be focusing on here. The Doomer is an individual who is typically in their 20s and male, although a Doomer in the philosophical sense does not need to be either. He or she does, however, need to be someone who feels a sense of aimlessness and loneliness, and is consequently stricken with a deep despair for life. For the Doomer, life is meaningless, and the world is inevitably doomed by humanity's ignorance, greed, and futility. As a result, the Doomer sees little to no reason in engaging in traditional pursuits, and thus retreats from society into apathetic isolation. This character is often used in videos and memes to illustrate various experiences that come with this pessimistic sense of life. Things like working a dead-end job, struggling to maintain or get over romantic relationships, excessive drinking and smoking, feeling alienated from one's friends and family, etc. This character's popularity and widespread relatability is very telling about the conditions of the modern person, specifically that of the current young adult generation. It reveals the depth of pessimism and nihilism being experienced, a hopelessness for both the now and for the future. One of the Doomer's counter characters is the Boomer, the name being derived from the term Baby Boomer, an individual born between 1946 and 1964, two generations or so before the Doomer. However, the age and generation of a Boomer does not necessarily matter. What does matter is this character's contrasting outlook on life. Opposed to the Doomer, the Boomer possesses a positive, can-do attitude. More specifically, in the context of the meme, the Boomer's attitude exists in a naive, blissful ignorance of truth. The Boomer chugs along in their ignorant delusion, unaware of the reality in which they live, mistakenly thinking they have it all under control. Where the Doomer is aware of the world's conditions and consequently pessimistic about them, the Boomer is unaware and thus ignorantly blissful. Unlike the Baby Boomers, the Doomer was born in or around the 90s and grew up through an era when technology developed at an unprecedented rate in an exceptionally small amount of time. The advent of the internet as well as affordable internet devices would completely change the way people could experience and understand the world. During this internet generation, children and young adults had access to a completely open and constant flow of information. 
an ability to see, hear, talk with, and engage in the entire world in real time, all the time. The world would shrink down to fit in the palm of one's hand, allowing one to easily see just how absurd, chaotic, and meaningless it truly is. As a result, a huge portion of an entire generation would realize early on that things weren't all good, that the can-do, positive attitude of the boomer was outdated and ignorant of what was really going on. With lingering counterculture narratives from the 60s and 70s, a decreasing popularity in Christianity following the Second World War, and an increasing access to information, this generation would be left with no traditional meaning or hope to fall back on. A generation where many find a piece of themselves in the Doomer. So now what? Are we doomed to exist in a world where the options are either blissful ignorance or informed melancholy? In order to better understand and deal with growing pessimistic and nihilistic tendencies, it is helpful to refer to the work of 19th century philosophers Arthur Schopenhauer and Friedrich Nietzsche. Arthur Schopenhauer is often regarded as the philosopher of pessimism, arguably the original Doomer. Like the Doomer's outlook, for Schopenhauer, life is in fact riddled with unavoidable pain, meaninglessness, and absurdity. For Schopenhauer, we are prisoners to our unconscious instinct to survive, reproduce, and sustain existence. And, in a traditional sense, everything we do in life is merely a product of this irrational force, void of any purpose other than to continue to sustain itself. As a result, we live a life of delusion, constantly in a frenzy, trying to impress sexual partners in order to reproduce, and trying to accomplish things in order to find happiness. Schopenhauer writes, There's only one inborn error, and that is the notion that we exist in order to be happy. So long as we persist in this inborn error, the world seems to us full of contradictions. For at every step, in things great and small, we are bound to experience that the world and life are certainly not arranged for the purpose of maintaining a happy existence. In Schopenhauer's mind, we want so badly to believe that we exist to be happy and to have specific purpose, but with an honest examination, we realize we do not. This perspective does not fall far from that of the Doomer. Arguably, neither the Doomer nor Schopenhauer are necessarily wrong in their assessments of life. Life is in fact linked with chaos, pain, and fundamental meaninglessness. The real problem, however, is not found in this realization, but how this realization is handled. Schopenhauer offered two solutions for the realization of life's meaningless suffering. Asceticism and Art Asceticism is the disciplined avoidance of pleasure, an overcoming of the unconscious desire and pursuit for the selfish and material, be it things like sex, vanity, money, social status, etc. Schopenhauer felt that by obtaining control over the ceaseless yearning for things, one can find a form of happiness in the present moment. However, Schopenhauer also acknowledged the sheer difficulty in accomplishing this feat, for it is not enough to merely realize the senselessness of one's behaviors in order to stop them from occurring. The level of discipline and commitment required would prove immensely difficult for even the wisest of individuals. Alternatively, Schopenhauer provided one other solution, engaging in the aesthetics of art and philosophy as much as possible. In this, Schopenhauer suggested that things like poetry, theater, music, paintings, literature, theory, etc. have the power to reveal and share truth a truth that liberates the individual during the moments he or she is engaging in it. By expressing our pains and sufferings or engaging in the expressions of others, we feel less imprisoned and less disillusioned in ourself. With this, one does not need to find anything worthwhile or ultimately meaningful in the materialistic or traditional world beyond the mere expression of one's disinterest and pain within it. In expressing pain and absurdity through arts and philosophy, the pain and absurdity is transmuted into wonder and purpose for oneself as well as others. Interestingly enough, the Doomer meme itself embodies this idea. The creation, sharing, and engaging of Doomer content is an example of a Doomer expressing their sense of doom and translating it into something enjoyable and meaningful. In an attempt to take this idea further, we will look to the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, a philosopher renowned for his nihilistic take on life. Nihilism is the belief in nothing, the principle that nothing has any fundamental meaning at the end of itself and that life is and will always involve a suffering through this meaninglessness. During his life in the 19th century, Nietzsche found that traditional religion ceased to help the modern person in dealing with the pains of life and that nihilism was the only rational and practical approach that remained. However, for Nietzsche, the meaninglessness found in nihilism did not suggest that we should give up and retreat into a dull, apathetic life. Rather, the realization that life is meaningless permits the individual to look inside him or herself and create their own meaning and self-identity. The world is full of systems and pressures to conform to the collective, religions, traditions, and mass movements that attempt to lead us in certain arbitrary directions. The individual, Nietzsche writes, has always had to struggle to keep from being overwhelmed by the tribe. If you try it, you will be lonely often and sometimes frightened. But no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning yourself. The pressure of accepting mass methodologies and principles in life is, has, and will always be immense. The resistance of such comes with feelings of alienation and hardship. However, for Nietzsche, 
the pain of caving in is infinitely worse. In the context of modern times, perhaps the Doomer feels a heightened alienation from the world because the internet compounds the weight of social pressure and a sense of detachment. However, this experience of alienation and despair is not unnatural nor without value. Rather, one must walk deliberately through the mud of life, realizing that there will be ongoing pains and challenges in their self-actualization, and instead of turning away from them, lean into them and face the sufferings head on, developing themselves and their personal meaning, no matter how uncommon or hard it may be. Nietzsche felt that the key to suffering is knowing how to use suffering. I assess the power of a will by how much resistance, pain, torture it endures and knows how to turn to its advantage, Nietzsche writes. By inviting suffering in and recognizing it as an opportunity to develop wisdom and resilience, we utilize it as a method of creating our own purpose and greatness. In the fundamental pain and meaninglessness of life, we must not find ourselves with an indifference that renders us lethargic and paralyzed away from caring about anything, but rather an indifference that inspires us to create meaning and care for things we deem enjoyable and engaging. For both Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, the greatest reason for life is found in the self-realization and self-expression of one's unique truth. The utilization of the suffering and chaos in life and turning it into wonder, wisdom, and greatness. With this in mind, if we square away our life as best we can, accepting the inevitable chaos and suffering, if we obtain the money we can, want, and need to sustain our life, attempting to keep a close eye on our unconscious, irrational desires, and if we live with an interest to create personal meaning and engage in expressive activities, then we can build a life worth living, even in the face of apparent chaos, doom, or futility. This attitude can be found in the hopeful Doomer character, Bloomer. A character who, in the meme, possesses the awareness of the sad and painful realities of life, but still sees that there could be purpose to it all, still sees that there is an opportunity for meaning and wonder to be created and experienced, and that, however messy the world may be, it is still worth playing in and trying to make the most of. decades has run. It's the underlying technology of digital currencies like Bitcoin. It's called the blockchain. So today we rely entirely on big intermediaries, middlemen like banks, to establish trust in our economy. And overall they do a pretty good job, but there are growing problems. To begin, they're centralized. That means that they can be hacked and increasingly are. They slow things down, it can take a second for an email to go around the world, but it can take days or weeks for money to move through the banking system across the city. They capture our data and they take a big piece of the action, 10 to 20 percent, just to send money to another country. Well, in 2008, the financial industry crashed and an unknown uh, anonymous person or persons named Satoshi Nakamoto developed a protocol for a, a digital cash that used an underlying cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. This cryptocurrency enabled people to establish trust and do transactions without a third party. Now don't be confused about Bitcoin. It's a cryptocurrency. It's not a fiat currency controlled by a nation state. But the real pony here is the underlying technology. It's called blockchain. For the first time now in human history, people everywhere can trust each other and transact peer to peer. Now you're probably wondering, well, how does this thing work? Fair enough. Assets, digital assets, are not stored in a central place, but they're distributed across a global ledger. And when a transaction is conducted, it's posted globally across millions and millions of computers. And out there around the world is a group of people called miners. And every 10 minutes, a block gets created that has all the transactions from the previous 10 minutes. And then the miners get to work trying to solve some uh, tough problems. And the first miner to find out the truth and to validate the block is rewarded in digital currency. And then that block is linked to the previous block and the previous block to create a chain of blocks. So if I wanted to go and, and hack a block, I'd have to hack that block, plus all the preceding blocks, the entire history of commerce, not just on one computer, but across millions of computers, simultaneously, 
all using the highest levels of encryption tough to do. And this is infinitely more secure than the computer systems that we have today. Blockchain, that's how it works. The things that surprised me were, were things that didn't happen in my lifetime, but happened before my lifetime. And that everything that is coming to me is new, that hasn't happened into my lifetime, I have to study. And that's by studying the Great Depression, we were able to anticipate the 2008 financial crisis. So there's a mechanistic reason. There are cause-effect relationships. And three big things that are happening in our lifetime that haven't happened before, I needed to examine. And those three things, I think if we focus on them, they pretty much encompass most. Those three things are, first, an enormous amount of debt creation, which is debt that's monetized, that has to do with the value of money in throughout history. It's been very much the case, in all cases throughout history, that when there's not enough money, there is the, then the creation of money. Rome, they had gold coins and they put other metals in it and they depreciated it and so on. So we have something that is going on with money, credit, and inflation. That's due to the fact that we don't have enough real money. Okay, that's one fact. The second is internal conflict. By measures, I like to have measures, and so there are lots of measures in this book. We have populism of the left and populism of the right that are irreconcilable differences. History shows that when the causes that people are behind are more important to them than the system is in jeopardy. And so if you look at populism or you look at the size of the wealth gaps, or the values gaps. They're the largest since the 1930 to 45 period, and it's understandable. And the third is the great power com conflict. We began our world order in 1945, and the pattern repeats all the time. There's a war. The winners of the war determine the world order, the rules of the game. That's why the United Nations is in New York, and the IMF in, and the World Bank are in Washington. And then you have the world order and the dominant power. The United States had 80% of the world's money, money was gold, and it had half the world's economy, and it had a monopoly on military power. And as that power changes, then you have great power conflict. And so you're having these three things happen again, for the, basically the same mechanistic reasons. And if you go back through history, that they repeat over so they have this cause effect. So I think that when we look at the future and we calculate it for just year by year, we're now in 2022. We're in the part of, they always do it the same way. You have a downturn and they print money and credit because that's the way that you stimulate the economy and so on. It produces inflation. They tighten monetary policy, there's a trade off. And, that, and there we are. Now, then you take that forward and you look at 2022, there's a political thing going on. We're going to have midterm elections in the United States. We're going to have a uh, change in government, the 20th People's Congress in China, and so on. There's a political thing going on. And then you take 1920, 2023 and 2024, and with this populism, you're going to have possibly irreconcilable differences. In other words, it's entirely possible that neither side accepts losing in the domestic. And so when you have that going on, you need the historical context. So mechanistically, that very much looks the same. Naturally, everyone is in a position that they needed more money. Where did they get the money from? If there was limited money, they'd have to get it from someplace else. But what they do is produce money. So central banks produce money. Where does the money come from? You could have it from taxes and take it from somewhere else. But that's difficult because people want to hold on to it and they don't want to give it up. But nobody asks, where do we get the, do we have enough money? But we need more money. Everybody agrees we need more money to spend. But if there was a limited amount of money, we would say, where do we get it from? And we'd have constraints. But we're not like that. So what happens is naturally you're in the positions that you need more money, and so the central banks print more money, 
And then through all of this credit, everybody says, we need more money, we got more money. But then we devalue money, it becomes less valuable. And surprise, we get inflation. Okay, shouldn't be a surprise. So when we are looking at the circumstances, we're now in a new era. We wish that there's coordination. We've lived in an era where we were global and the way resources were allocated was where was it more cost efficient? So if it was cost efficient here, you'd send the capital, you'd build it there and that would raise employment and so on. And that's what we've come to believe is a fair system. But that's only because we've gotten used to that. But if you go back and look at and today, many people would believe that's not a fair system. So here we are in the fragmented world that we're in. And so the resource allocation system is no longer economic. The resource allocation is political and ideological. So when we ask ourselves and we wish for cooperation, it's understandable that we won't get cooperation because there is a risk, there is conflicts. There's an internal conflict of civil war. So how do we distribute the wealth within our country? So we'll have it within the country. There's a hell of a fight over that. And so there's the willingness to fight over that. And then the same is true internationally. So what is America first? Or what is that in terms of that? And so I think we have to understand, we have to keep in mind that when we say we're going to cooperate or should, in a world where self-sufficiency, because we could go to war, becomes important. The efficiencies are no longer the most important things. Survival is the most important thing. The possibility of a war is an important thing. And it changes behaviors in ways that are logical, but maybe undesirable for those of us who are in a perspective that we believe that we should be in this together. And how do we work together? So I think it's all understandable. Okay, so that depreciates the value of money. We are going to have more conflict. We're going to have more inflation causes domestic political conflict. So it'll be a big issue in the 2022 elections and the 2024 elections. That's just how the machine works. And in the meantime, we have, and the war in the Ukraine and Russia and with China is, a, is understandable in terms of a big, the big powers conflicts. And so we see the world, if you read history and you see this happen over and over again, you see the world is now breaking up into sides. It's like their allied powers and their access powers and their neutral powers. And those ideologies become the dominant consideration. So it's entirely possible, for example, that we could see in, in, in China and so on that it's no longer desirable or politically acceptable to do business in China. It may not be. Now you think about how intertwined the world economy is. 22% of American manufactured goods imports come from China. So let's just imagine the implications for inflation and the inefficiencies. That's just mechanistically what's going on. So as a mechanic who was looking at next year and the year after and where we are in that thing, I'm just saying it's, it, it's undesirable. And the unimaginable is becoming increasingly probable. There is going to be, when you're stuck with two trade-offs, too much inflation, or you're stuck with too much economic weakness, then you navigate through the middle, and that means something like stagflation. And so I think we're entering a period of stagflation. And, and I think the political and the wealth gap issues and so on create a set of circumstances that it's not easy to get out of. We have is an enough tightening by the Federal Reserve to deal with inflation adequately is too much tightening for the markets and the economy. So the Fed is going to be in a very difficult place. We are living through financial idiocracy right now. Absolutely financial idiocracy. I can't even believe what is happening right now. So I'm, I'm gonna forget the introduction that I usually do. I'm gonna get right into it. Stanley Druckenmiller, Drunk and Miller, uh, predicts potential crypto renaissance if 
central bank faith is lost. How many of you have any faith in central banks at this point? I mean, I don't. I'm sure anybody with two brain cells to put together do, don't trust central banks whatsoever. But he says that, you know, until then, uh, we won't have a crypto renaissance, essentially. But I think we've had our crypto renaissance this last bull market when we saw prices rise from $3,500 to $69,000. And it's not just because of the price rise, but because so many people are placing their faith in Bitcoin rather than central banks because they don't trust central banks. So the renaissance that drunk in Miller said that we will finally experience once people lose faith in central banks, it happened last bull market when countries started getting on to Bitcoin, making it legal tender. Corporations uh, had their balance sheet in Bitcoin. So that is a renaissance right there. That's the first time to where people felt comfortable enough to put them put Bitcoin on their balance sheet, essentially. And here's some news right now that you, kind of solidifies what I'm saying, what I just said. Okay, so investors sell Great British Pound and Euro for Bitcoin in record numbers reaching $881 million in volume. So that shows right there that people are inter more interested in hedging themselves against this crazy fiat system with Bitcoin. And that's a trend that's going to continue. Like I've said before, uh, inflation is not going anywhere. There's no way the Federal Reserve can bring down inflation. It's here to stay. Yes, it's not gonna see, it's, it's gonna go through its ups and downs, but it's gonna be on a upward trajectory, okay? The Citadel CEO, Ken Griffin says, there will be a recession. Okay, keep in mind, these are old school traditional financial centers, right? Uh, these are dinosaur dying financial centers. People, you know, kids nowadays that are born right now will never be using Citadel. They'll never be using any of this crap, okay? And here's a reason why. <clears throat> keep in mind that we are definitely in a recession even though the federal reserve doesn't want to admit we are in a recession even though uh, the textbook definition of a recession is two or more quarters of gdp growth being down that's it it's as simple as that but he doesn't see a u.s recession so you have citadel ceo um, or citadel which runs a lot of people's money for them they they have all of these people around and they they cannot figure out that we are in a recession but people are going to give these people money to try to figure out the global macro environment so that they can make money off it and they seriously can't figure it out that we are in a recession these people are crazy these these guys are psychopaths seriously they know what's happening but they don't want to tell anybody about it. You know, if you're going to run somebody's money for them, I'd be pretty upfront with what is happening out there. And regardless of whether or not it scared people or not, I would tell people what's going on. Um, lastly, Federal Reserve Jerome Powell says a US CBDC would not be anonymous. Wow, that's brilliant, man. Like really, do you know, I figured that out two years ago or three years ago. Uh, when I was telling everybody that a CBDC would come out and it would be full control with zero transparency of, on their side and, and there would be absolute control. It'd be like looking into, into a um, microscope at your daily life and you can see exactly what you're doing in every step of your life. There will be no more privacy, zero privacy, and it is literally the most dangerous thing that humanity is facing at this point. And I think what's happening right now is that the more pain that happens with the uh, with bonds, with um, with the stock market, the uncertainty that that's happening right now, I think that people will be begging for a CBDC because governments governments will say, hey, 
This is going to save you. This is going to save us. This is going to make for a soft landing. I think that's what, what they're going to try to pull on you. So just be aware of what is happening. Realize that a central bank digital currency is not a good thing. I'm going to keep bringing this, this, this up over and over and over again because I think people really need to hear this. So that's all I have today. Please like and subscribe and I will talk to you soon. Bitcoin is still over $19,000. Even what we, after we've seen a 50, almost a $58 trillion drawdown out of the equity market and uh, the US equity market and also fixed income in the United States of the, of the market capitalization. So we are still over $19,000. How is that possible? Even after we've had Luna, we've had Celsius, we've had you know, the dollar skyrocketing to, I mean, almost all time highs, essentially all time highs in many different currencies, especially the pound, uh, the euro. So with all that said, I'm about to get into why I am still not worried about Bitcoin whatsoever. And I'm going to explain to you how much money the, the Federal Reserve and other governments around the world are about to be printing and it's going to be, it's going to spin your head around. All right. But first, please like and subscribe. Check us down below for our CT Club where you get our trade alerts, portfolio updates, and you get to see how we are doing in this bear market, what, what we are getting into. Okay, so you've had the 10 year almost reach 4%. That's really dangerous because that is the debt market. So if you have an unstable debt market, that's going to rattle everything. That's why you're experiencing the stock market going down like it's been. But what's interesting, you haven't been really seeing Bitcoin going too much lower. It, it's range bound, even through this, this unstabilization of the, of the bond market, which is phenomenal. I, I'm actually really surprised that Bitcoin has held up so much during that time or during this time. Um, that, that's phenomenal. That is a really good sign that Bitcoin potentially has bottomed, okay? You have a lot of people who are like, oh, it's gonna go to 10,000, blah, blah, blah. Okay, hold on a second. So if it's gonna hit $10,000, like we would have to have a complete capitulate 20% drawdown in the stock market, easy 20% uh, drawdown if, if we are going to get Bitcoin to go down to 16, 15, whatever thousand, in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm just seeing a lot of weakness around the world, the global economy especially. We are definitely in a severe recession, uh, potentially a depression. If you can, if you look at other factors, it could signal a depression. Um, okay, so now this is how crazy governments are. I'm going to go over a couple things. So the U.S. Secretary Yellen said yesterday, I don't see any erratic financial market conditions. So this is how out of touch these people are. They, she really said she doesn't see any erratic, anything erratic in the, these markets. Really, have you not seen the 10 year? Gosh, you're, you're the unstable bond market, which is the debt market. Holy cow. So you know what's happening there. What, what's happening right now? is the debt market's rising, but guess why, why it keeps stopping? Why it's not at 4% right now? It would have been at 4%, but the Federal Reserve is injecting liquidity in there so that what they're doing is they're printing a bunch of currency, then they're throwing it into the debt market, right? And then that's keeping the debt market lower. So, but, but this is the law of diminishing returns. So the more they, they do this, the more they, they have to pump more capital each and every time, okay? And it gets less and less of an effect, okay, on the barn market. This is how it works, and this is why it's so dangerous. But here's the thing, people are like, oh, they're on quantitative tightening. That's what the Federal Reserve says. But you know what they're doing? They're printing so much more currency than they've ever printed before, and they're injecting it into the bond market. That's a great excuse to do that. Plus, what, are, what else are they going to do? What else are they going to do? They're going to uh, put even more mortgage-backed securities on the balance sheet. They are. I showed you a couple days ago that the Federal Reserve is not decreasing their, their mortgage-backed securities like so many smart people on Twitter say. No, they're not. And they are going to continue purchasing it, especially when you have the 30-year mortgage rates 
a, a, 30, um, a year ago, 30-year mortgage rates were around 3%. Just two weeks ago, the average 30-year mortgage rate in the U.S. hit 6%. It's now above 7%, you know? So all these people are gonna probably lose their homes, and guess who's gonna buy up their homes? Sir government, yeah. You remember that whole thing of the World Economic Forum where you, you own no nothing and you'll be happy? This is straight in line with that. Okay, because if the government keeps the, the prices high of, of houses, well, they own the houses, right? Boom. And they printed a lot more currency in the meantime. So, lastly, I'm going to cover this. This is crazy. But people thought I was a conspiracy theorist when I said the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve, is buying their own bonds. Well, now you have the Bank of England will temporarily... Uh, begin purchases of long-dated UK government bonds in order to restore orderly market conditions. Okay, they said that these will be carried out on whatever scale necessary to soothe markets. Okay, so <laughs> that means so much currency printing all around the world. They are all in unison. All these central banks work together to go ahead and print, print, and print. They cannot stop printing because they're, they have a debt-based system. So their currencies, every currency in the world is debt-based. It feeds off debt. If you stop feeding it debt, it dies. So this is what's happening right now around the world. And uh, just be really prepared for a ton of inflation. Prepared, be prepared for Bitcoin to be volatile but also skyrocket once this thing lets loose. So I expect Bitcoin to do really well in the future. Um, I probably go much higher than we could have ever expected because of the amount of currency printing that is going on right now. Well, anyways, that's all I have. Please like and subscribe and I will talk to you soon. Bye. If you were to ask any boy seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. What, where do you want to be when you're 25, 30? Where do you want to be? They're going to say, big house, fast car, beautiful wife. That's what they're going to say. Every single one. And slowly, the programming of the Matrix beats this dream out of men. It beats it out of men till they get to my age and they're fat with a woman who doesn't love them, who's unattractive, who's a low quality person, who drags them down, work it's a dead end job, and their wife is in their ear saying, oh, you shouldn't watch Tristan and Andrew Tate. Those, those guys haven't grown up. Gro growing up is an analogy for having the, the aspiration that every boy has beaten out of them and accepting the programming of the Matrix. And we tell the young men out there, you need to be able to identify low quality friends and cut them off and curate the people around you into a group of winners, a group of men who want to go out there and achieve the same things as you. And the journey to the top not only won't be lonely, but it will be far easier. I saw a TikTok of him recently saying, Hey Andrew, I may be fat, blah blah blah, I have a wife, a woman chose me. And his, that one line, I just thought a woman chose me. When you're a man at the top, you get to choose the women that you want to be with. A woman chose you, well done. Like, that, that you, his dynamic is so wrong, even in that one line, which is which one of the only things I've ever heard this guy say, by the way. So when you say I don't have social media, I don't have a TikTok account. I don't have a TikTok account. I'm not that big in, in consuming social media because I feel like my use for social media is I feel like I have a good message to put out there. So I, I concentrate on content creation rather than content consumption. The advice is hang around with people who people who, who, who have a good mindset. I was with my brother and I was like, oh, Andrew, I just completed this round of 41 kills, one death. That's pretty cool. Andrew looks at me from the couch. I swear to God, looks over me and goes, yeah, Tristan, but it doesn't matter, does it? And I was like, it doesn't matter, does it? And I turned that game off and I never, I don't think I've ever spent more than 10 minutes playing a video game ever since that day. So hang around better people. You know, if you're wasting your life, you're wasting your talents, and you're sitting there jerking off all day, if you're sitting around dudes who are talking about who their favorite porn star is, leave that group of friends. Cut low quality people out of your life, and slowly, as you go out into the world and apply yourself at different things that are more useful, you'll probably find out that you're not as useless as you think. Or you might be, in which case, you know, you all need some of the flip the burgers and wash the cars, so I'll tip you heavily, my friend, don't worry. Guys, open your eyes. When I say, uh, you know, 
Well, actually, don't be a brokey. Learn how to make some money. Level up, you know? It's not about money, necessarily. It's about, I believe, if you're a young man in this world, and you don't have your financial situation together, and you're not part of the, the top 1%, then you're not going to attract the top 1% women. You're not going to meet the women with low body counts who want to love you and start a family with you. If you stay a low quality man, you're going to be a low quality woman, start a low quality family, and have a low quality life. But I say it in an abrasive way, and people will cut clips of me or my brother saying, oh, you know, don't be broke, make some more money, you know, you don't want to be broke, you don't want to be a loser. But I'm not trying to upset anyone, I'm just trying to show people the way that I think is, is to a better life, and a more productive, more healthy, more happy life. The media, I think, is so spun, spun so negatively against me and Andrew. I try to empower young men to stay away from toxic people. I'm not talking about toxic women. I will say nine times on a podcast, look, if your friends are sitting around smoking drugs, if your friends, your male friends, are losers, if your male friends have no ambition, if your male friends are fat and overweight and keep them from going to the gym, stay away from them. And then on the same podcast, once I'll say, yeah, if you have a girl, if you have a woman who, you know, is trying to control you and is overeating, is lazy, and doesn't like you going to the gym and is a bit of a slob, you need to cut her off. It's, oh my God, Tristan's misogynist. It's selective hearing. I'm trying to teach young men to stay away from low quality people men and women, male and female, but they'll sound like the bits where I talk about low quality women, because low po quality people of all races, genders, sexes, they, they exist, and you need, to, you need to stay away from all of them. I, I never wanted to be a multi-millionaire. Andrew once said to me, famously, Tristan, if we could just find a way to make, this before the internet, if we could just find a way to make like 50, 100 pounds a day from home, that would alleviate a lot of our problems. Start small, because as you climb the mountain, and you reach where you want to reach, you realize that there are new mountains to climb. There are new mountains to climb for me right now, and I'm at a level that a lot of people can't even dream of getting to. But you see it, it opens new doors when you accomplish the goals that you're aiming for, and uh, it opens your eyes to what's possible from there. So don't think I want to be a multi Think, okay, I want some financial independence. I want to work 20 hours at the fast food store instead of 40 to supplement my income from home. Okay, I've done that. Now I have more free time. Where do I go from here? So don't don't think how am I going to become a multi-millionaire. Think of your short-term goals. Make sure your mother works less, buy yourself some nicer clothes, you know, live in a better apartment, and think of how you can make those things happen. And as you go up in value as a man, you'll learn a lot about yourself, and from then you can tackle bigger goals. When people say things like money doesn't buy happiness, I would say yes, it actually does if you know what to buy. Mm. Lamborghinis are cool, Gatsby's are cool. But you know, calling your mother and say, hey mom, well, you're working that shitty job in that kitchen, washing those dishes, you know what, you never have to work. Mm. That, that's happiness. Yeah, I don't know. And no amount of, you know, being broke with good things, good will, or prank is going to make that happen. It takes money to make that happen. But that's a good thing. It's about, you, know, have to know what's, you have to know what to buy, you have to know what's really important. Uh, when I needed this surgery on my shoulder, I called the same surgeon who did Conor McGregor's leg and Walter Federer's elbow. Oh, I paid for five thousand dollars to get the procedure done. You know, that's happiness. I don't want some fucking NHS surgeon to come out with my arm. I've only, only got two arms. Can't pull it off one up. So yeah, I mean, it depends. If you know what to buy, if you know what to spend it on. But uh, chasing material possessions is uh, it's, it's it's fun, but it's not it's not necessarily happiness. But I was always a very happy, content individual. So now I'm happy and content and we're just so it's great. Look, genetics, intellect, wit, I mean, there are various things that we're all born with. And when you get to the age of 12, 13, you can see who's becoming a man with physicality, who's becoming a man with smart. Yes, some people have further to go than others. I know people who are genetically blessed. Genetically blessed. Guys who never ever train in little iron six pack big arms on the time. That guy obviously doesn't have to try as hard as the skinny little door to be physically attractive to women. He has to try probably not very hard at all. Maybe he's six foot four, like me. Well, let me tell you something. Everybody can get there. If you're dumb, you can get smarter. If you are weak, you can get stronger. It's just some people are so far gone. In terms of being a strong guy, they're two out of ten. Now, instead of realizing that they need to walk in the gym, three hours a day every day for five years to be a physically imposing man, they think, oh, well, I have an opportunity to argue well. So yeah, you can actually, you can actually turn a geek into a stud. If someone's a geek, it takes a lot more work than turning a guy who's not quite a stud into a stud. But you only get one body and you only get one life, so you need to get up, stand in front of the mirror, take your shirt off, look at yourself, and think, you know, how far do I have to go? 
What do I need to change about myself to be the man? I do it every day. Maybe there's a lot you need to change, maybe there's only a little bit. If you're someone who struggles with loneliness or has a hard time being alone, then watch this video through to the end and I promise that you will never look at being alone the same way again. I, I spend a lot of time alone and in this video I want to talk about my relationship with loneliness and how it's evolved over the years to become not only one of the things that I most cherish but one of the things that I most draw power from. One of my favorite things to do at night is to look out my window. I love the stark contrast of light versus darkness. Thousands of tiny lights. What an interesting sensation to realize that every single one of them represents life in some shape or form. I look out to the apartment building across the way, and in one apartment I can see kids and puppies running back and forth while the adults hang out in the living room just sitting around in a circle of chairs, just talking. I love that about Columbia. In another apartment, I can see the lights of the TV dancing off the face of a woman frantically pedaling away on an exercise bike. She's been pedaling away like this every single night, and that belly doesn't look like it's getting any smaller. Then a few floors down, I catch the thick glow of a cigarette pole. When someone's on their balcony, alone, in darkness, staring out into the distance, and I wonder what they're thinking. I really enjoy the exercise of observing my own loneliness within the greater context of those around me. I don't really have social friends and it's been years since it was a normal thing for me to go out. Entire days spent working towards my goals and then I go to sleep and I just repeat the same process over and over. Almost a decade of existing this way, which I think is a significant amount of time to be able to positively conclude that the more that I embrace these long periods of being alone, the more that I'm able to thrive in my personal and professional life. But uh, it hasn't always been this way. There were a few periods in my life that were characterized by overwhelming loneliness, and understanding those periods has been invaluable to my journey. When I was 13 years old, puberty hit me really hard. Uh, my face was completely covered in acne, nobody wanted to be my friend, and even people that were previously my friends were now embarrassed to be seen talking to me. It's one thing to feel alone when nobody's around, but it's entirely another thing to feel alone within a large group of people. Every day felt infinite. During lunch period, because I didn't have a table to sit at, I would buy my lunch, and then when nobody was looking, I would just go to the bathroom and I would sit in a stall until the bell rang to signal the next period. And this was before cell phones, so I didn't have uh, a digital means through which I could escape my miserable reality. It was just me alone in that bathroom stall, counting down the seconds to the next period, afraid to death that at any moment someone would discover what I was doing every day. Thankfully, as it turns out, other people didn't really care about what I was doing as much as I thought that they did. So when the infinite school day was finally over, I would literally run home where my real social life was waiting for me in the form of role-playing video games. First was Chrono Trigger, then Final Fantasy VII, and then Xenogears. My only real social interactions during this entire period of my life was with the characters in these games, and I fully credit them for shaping me into the person that I am today. They helped me to understand the importance of hard work and discipline in achieving difficult goals, uh, how hard work and discipline were what made difficult goals even worth it in the first place. They taught me about honor, courage, loyalty, trust, and even love. They gave me strong archetypes and, and reasons for wanting to strive towards embodying them. Uh, the hero, the dreamer, the martyr, the mentor. I would go to sleep every night feeling like I was still in the world from those games, but every morning it was back to school, back to the infinite reality of being alone within a large group of people.
I remember one day as I sat there on a toilet bowl eating my lunch, uh, I decided that I should try to figure out exactly why I was such a loser. I mean, yeah, I was extremely ugly, but there were other kids that were at least as ugly as I was, so why was it that even they avoided me? It wasn't until many years later that I realized that I could actually be my own friend. I could be my best friend. So fast forward a bit to March 2nd, 2011. I was now 26 years old. It was close to midnight. I was on the roof of my apartment building where I lived in Brooklyn, New York. I was staring out uh, onto the New York City skyline, which has a really funny way of either making you feel like you're on top of the world or making you feel like you're being crushed under it. I was in the middle of a, a massive depression. And while during the daytime, I was somewhat able to distract myself with TV shows and internet browsing, uh, there was something about being alone at night that just felt um, unbearable. Just a few weeks earlier, a girl that I thought was the love of my life had left me to go back to a man that was far better than I was. And so, standing alone on that roof, pulling on a cigarette, feeling more alone and depressed than I had ever been, I had an epiphany. And so, what exactly happened in that moment, I'll talk about in another video, but when I went back to my apartment, I was a completely different person than from when I had left it. I spent the next year and two months in almost complete isolation. I began to immerse myself in books. I would read and then I would apply. For the first time in my life, I had both the desire to discover who I could be and the motivation to bring that version of myself into reality. I decided that in roughly a year's time, I would compete in an Ironman. And I went from someone who has never run more than a few blocks to training up to seven hours per day. Every morning at 5 a.m., before everyone else had a fair chance to wake up, with absolutely zero hesitation, I would literally spring up from my nice, warm, cozy bed and, and sprint over five blocks to a public pool where I would throw myself into freezing cold water to start my swim training. I did all my run training at night so that I could be alone. Uh, cold, cold New York nights that took me over the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan and then back over the Williamsburg Bridge into Brooklyn. Every day was me alone versus myself. And for the first time in my life, not only was I conscious of this battle, I was actually winning it every single day. On the weekends, long, long seven hour bike rides that took me deep into New Jersey. And every minute of those seven hours, I was pushing myself. They say that most long distance competitions aren't so much about endurance as they are about just managing pain, and I completely agree. I trained in complete solitude for a year and two months, and for as good as a writer as I hope to become, I don't think I will ever find the right combination of words to properly communicate just how magical this period of my life was. When I wasn't training, I was working on my skills as a website designer, where I went from working for free or a measly few hundred bucks building good websites that took me months to build to getting paid thousands of dollars to build incredible websites that took me a fraction of the time to build. Working to improve myself in an environment where I was completely isolated, completely alone, allowed me to feel present at all times. Why had I feared being alone for so many years? I believe that hidden under the mask of what society wants us to believe that we are, that we each have a unique essence. And it's in solitude where my true essence thrives. Before my epiphany, I saw loneliness as something that I ought to avoid at all costs. This was the perception of a slave, a slave to a system designed to maximize profit at all costs. If we are programmed to fear being alone, it reduces the risk that we may go inside of ourselves and discover who we really are. The risk that we may come to know ourselves on a profound level. And, and just imagine for a second what would happen to this system if everyone came to truly know themselves. If we all suddenly realized that we didn't need products or pills to fix all of our problems, if we all suddenly realized that our programmed worship of material things is literally the thing that makes us unhappy, if we all suddenly realized that being alone for a while isn't just okay, it's necessary. These days, if I'm 
alone eating a meal or alone in the bathroom and I suddenly instinctively find myself pulling out my phone so that I can watch something on YouTube or scroll through Instagram so that I can remove the feeling of being alone, I'm able to quickly identify that these temptations are the tentacles of a system, a, a false reality, like desperately trying to pull me back in. In many ways, the, the simple act of existing within this system, as we all do, is like a progressively worsening disease. Uh, browsing the internet, watching Netflix, even just talking to friends, this is all part of this closed loop of the system. And the more time that we spend not alone, the more deeply we become infected. Being alone is okay. Being alone is the cure. This is a, a huge benefit of, of meditation. Meditation for me is the realization that there is only the now and in this now I am not alone because in this now I am present with myself. When I sit down to meditate I, I essentially am going to the meditation but when I'm alone at, at three in the morning writing words like the ones like you're presently listening to right now the meditation comes to me. When I'm alone staring out my window at all of the thousands of lights and realizing that each one of them represents individual life with its own unique experience, its own unique essence, I realize that I'm never alone. Some of you watching this may perceive this as sad or depressing, but if you spent more time alone, perhaps you'd realize that you're really just looking into yourself. In a world and, and a life that has become so overwhelmingly noisy, silence now passes over me like a cool, relaxing breeze. I love being alone. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. In the film The Matrix, humanity believes itself to exist within a real world, but it actually exists within a simulated reality, otherwise referred to as The Matrix, which was designed by intelligent, self-aware machines to keep mankind asleep while it uses their bodies for energy. Now, The Matrix is a fictional movie, but after spending the greater part of the last decade deeply exploring its numerous themes and philosophical inspirations, I would actually argue that it's a more accurate representation of reality than the reality that we perceive. Because we live during a time where virtually everything that we perceive as real is merely an imitation of the real. And in this video, I'll, I'll show you step by step how we're not only already living in a simulation, but more importantly, I'll show you what we can do about it. So let's begin. Reality as we know it is an anti-nature simulation. This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. So when explaining this concept to others, I found that the easiest way is to start by understanding the following. Nature is the true reality. Everything that is not nature, i.e. everything created by man, is essentially two things. First, everything created by man increasingly exists as a more believable simulation of the real thing that it's replacing. Processed food is an increasingly believable simulation of real food. Pornography is an increasingly believable simulation of real sexual intimacy. Video games are an increasingly believable simulation of real games. Digital social networks are an increasingly believable simulation of real social networks where the real people that we think we're observing and interacting with are merely the projected residual self-image of those people. We see only what they want to show us, which tends to be stuff that confirms who they believe or desire themselves to be. Even the universe itself is now being simulated in the form of a metaverse. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. Second, 
everything created by man moves us further away from nature, further away from reality. Technology moves us further away from nature. I think this is pretty obvious, but what's less obvious is how removed we are from nature even when we believe ourselves to be in nature. When we're outside, our physical bodies are usually at least three layers removed from the actual ground, right? Those three layers being the pavement, our shoes, and then our socks. And when are we even really outside? Usually for brief moments as we move from one inside to another to schools where we learn about everything except how to know ourselves, to work where we generally have to do something we don't want to do to be able to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't care about, to gyms where we simulate running on human hamster wheels to burn off calories from foods we shouldn't have eaten to pursue the appearance of health, which is of course much more important than actual health itself. Or to where we live, which in my case is a moderately sized box, 30 floors above the ground, still not quite high enough to escape the pollution and noise below, uh, and where what little light that does enter does so through polarized glass. Nature is real, and everything else is a simulation. And as time goes on, reality as we know it is increasingly removed from nature and increasingly constituted by everything else. The simulation helps us to escape death. All creatures are destined to die. However, human beings, being the only creature capable of seeing into the future, are subsequently the only creature capable of contemplating the inevitable death that awaits them. Ernest Becker, an American cultural anthropologist and author of The Denial of Death, which is one of my top five favorite books ever, believed that if we were to truly grasp the significance of the inevitability of death, that we'd be paralyzed by anxiety. And so to lessen our fear of death, he posits that we try to overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny of man. The true reality, which I'll simply refer to as nature, is where this awareness of death resides, because it's in nature where man must accept that he is a small, trembling animal who will decay and die. In the modern age, the primary way through which we're able to deny death is by moving further away from nature and by moving further into the simulation. Let me try to explain all of this in a way that most of you will be able to relate to. You know that uncomfortable feeling you sometimes feel when it's nighttime or when we're all alone? Now, in a broad sense, we probably experience this feeling as generalized anxiety. And as soon as we feel it, we probably reach for our phone or look for some other way to distract ourselves from it. However, if we allow this feeling to go beyond that anxiety layer, we may begin to experience this feeling as the uncomfortable sensation that maybe we're behind in life or perhaps that we're wasting our life altogether. So at this point, we'll almost certainly reach out for our phone or find some way to distract ourselves. But what would happen if we did the opposite? If instead of running from this feeling, we actually welcomed it into our consciousness with a warm smile and a glass of milk. What we come to realize is that this feeling at its absolute root is that which we most wish to deny, the knowledge that we are destined to die. The simulation understands this, and so while many of us see these various manifestations of the simulation, social media, Netflix, video games, as means by which we can improve life and make it more enjoyable, they're also a means by which we can escape the reality of death. <laughs> it is, of course, a way of all things. You see, there is only one constant, one universal, it is the only real truth, causality. Action, reaction, cause, and effect. Everything begins with choice. No, wrong. Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without. And this is the nature of the universe. So, who controls the simulation? At a low level, it's the media, which generally exists to both reinforce and perpetuate uh, both existing and evolving paradigms of the simulation. At mid-level, it's the government, which establishes and reinforces the explicit rules of the simulation. At a high level, it's companies and corporations who create uh, everything that is not nature, i.e. the material substance of the simulation. And then at the highest level, it's an increasingly smaller group of individuals who exercise increasingly greater control over corporations, governments, and media. 
Within the simulation, control is power, and to acquire more power at the highest levels is to perpetuate the simulation to the extent that for normal humans who don't have power, choice becomes an illusion because their future is already being decided for them. The Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. The simulation is a complex system of control. So to put it simply, the simulation is the world that has been pulled over our eyes to blind us from the truth that we are its slaves. We agree to participate in and obey the simulation, and in return, we are granted the means by which we can either mitigate or fully retreat, fully escape from the horrifying reality of nature itself and the inevitability of death that waits us there. This is how people come to fervently support a particular political candidate without being able to name a single one of their policies, or how they can come to label someone as ignorant or dangerous without ever having authentically engaged with that person's ideas. Nietzsche referred to this as herd mentality, which he defined as the tendency for people's behavior or beliefs to conform to those of the group to which they belong. The simulation is what creates these groups, and, and broadly speaking, this is how so many of us can come to feel tremendous confidence and authority in relation to something that we know absolutely nothing about. All right, guys, so here's the good news, perhaps a glimmer of hope for you guys. Uh, if you pay attention, you'll notice that there's actually a massive battle taking place. That This small group of people with an increasing amount of power are actually fighting within themselves, trying to wrest power away at the highest levels, and in the process, they're making themselves more vulnerable than ever before. As a result, our distrust of media, governments, and corporations is at an all-time high. Alternatives are not only emerging, but they're being rapidly elevated by a growing number of people who are waking up from the dream of the simulation. And these include more authentic information sources, and we can see a lot of them here on YouTube or on places like Substack and Reddit. Uh, individuals who speak to fundamental human truths are being elevated faster than the simulation can find ways to brand them as dangerous heretics. And blockchain technology is here. Uh, initially what we're seeing is the potential of a universal currency that could eventually replace the entire financial system of the simulation, but long term, blockchain technology could eventually lead to viable, uh, deregulated content platforms where we don't have to worry about being manipulated, censored, or exiled for ideas that run counter uh, to the simulation or to the ideas that the simulation wishes to promote. The delicate uh, illusion of control employed by the simulation is starting to crack, and we're seeing through those cracks into the potential of a future where power is wrested away from that small group and redistributed back to the masses. But who knows where all of this will truly end up. What I do know is it's more important than ever for people to free themselves from the invisible shackles of the simulation to be able to gaze into the abyss of reality with ever-increasing clarity. And to do this, I have one major recommendation. Learn to look death squarely in the face. That's where our true freedom is hidden. I, I believe that's where all power truly begins. The hero's journey always begins with the call. Look, you're in Sleepyland. Wake, come on a trip. There's a whole aspect of your consciousness, your being, that's not been touched. So you're at home here? Well, there's not enough of you there. And so it starts. In his book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell observed that the hero of every great story or myth across the whole of human history has more or less the same narrative progression. Ushered forth by the call to adventure, the hero, aided by a wise mentor, must journey into an unknown world where they will battle through great adversity as they make their way towards a monster they must slay to claim a treasure they will need to defeat their ultimate challenge before finally returning home completely transformed from when they left. Now, Campbell referred to this progression as the hero's journey, and if we look closely, it's the same progression that we all pass through on the journey of personal development. 
So in today's video, I'm gonna summarize the hero's journey of personal development in 12 stages. Understanding this journey will be a revelation for many of you because if you're presently at a point where you're stuck in your own journey or just not sure where to go next, this video will give you tremendous clarity. Now, if you really want to benefit from the video, I suggest that as we move through the 12 stages in this video, try to layer them onto your own journey. What was your call to adventure? Who or what was your mentor that helped you to cross the threshold into the world of the unknown? This will all make sense in a second, so let's begin. Stage one, ordinary world. Every hero begins their journey in the ordinary world, which is the world as we have always known it to be. Here's where the story begins, or rather, where the story has yet to begin. Here, we are comfortable. Here, every rule and tradition was established by the society around us long before we had any say in the matter. Here, the final destination of our path is not to discover what Campbell would describe as the inward thing that we basically are, but rather, and perhaps tragically, to merely conform to the expectation of what we ought to be. Here, we have a sense that something is not quite right, but we don't yet possess that which will enable us to articulate. Stage two, call to adventure. The call to adventure is an invitation to embark on a new quest into an unknown world. A quest that we know we must accept because we sense that within that quest is our salvation. The call to adventure can happen intentionally, such as when we move to a different country, start a new business, or embark on the journey to master a new skill. But more often than not, the call to adventure happens unintentionally, like when someone breaks our heart, when we have an epiphany, or otherwise any sort of life circumstance that causes us to fall so far down or up <laughs> that we are forced out of the comfort of the original world and into a space where we can see into this unknown world and understand this potentially life-changing adventure that awaits us. Stage three, refusal of the call. Now, the unknown world is a terrifying place because it's completely foreign to us. And to enter this world is to understand the many risks and perils of the journey ahead of which we are woefully underprepared. So when presented with such a vast unknown, most of us initially choose to scurry back to the comforts of the original world where many of us remain permanently. If we are to answer the call to adventure, we're gonna need a little bit of help. Stage four, meeting the mentor. Now, the mentor is someone who, having already ventured out into and returned from the unknown world, possesses a unique knowledge of it, which they can use to prepare us and give us the confidence to venture out ourselves. While the archetypal mentor is traditionally a wise old man, mentors can actually come in many different forms and even iterations. Friends, philosophy, a movie, or a blog post. The mentor that helped me to answer the call was Napoleon Hill, and while he actually passed away 30 years before I was born, his book, How to Think and Grow Rich, gave me what I needed to be able to accept the call and venture out into the unknown world for myself. Stage five, crossing the threshold. Here, the hero departs from the cherished comfort of the original world and ventures forth into the discomfort of the unknown world where many challenges lie ahead. This is a point of no return. While in the original world, we could faintly sense that something was not quite right, here in the unknown world, that sense transforms into an extraordinary, all-encompassing goal to find the monster of that which is not quite right and to slay it and claim its treasure. I crossed the threshold and entered my point of no return when at the lowest point in my life, I had an epiphany, a sudden realization that all of the pain and suffering that I was experiencing at that moment, I could in fact experience as power. The sort of realization that is impossible to unrealize. If you're someone who feels like they still haven't crossed the threshold, you should understand one thing. To cross the threshold, you must give yourself no viable path by which to return. So burn your ships, take the leap, ad astra per aspera. Stage six, tests, allies, and enemies. Here the hero begins to battle through the obstacles of the unknown world, and in doing so begins to distinguish allies from enemies. While these can be people, the greatest allies and enemies are encountered within. One of the greatest enemies of the unknown world is often our own ego, which 
Desiring the external validation of others will encourage us to pretend we know things, which is precisely the thing that prevents us from ever truly knowing anything. Thus, one of our greatest allies in this world is humility. To come to know, we must accept that we do not. And there are many more allies and enemies in this world that will reveal themselves to us as we progress through more battles. Stage seven, approach to the inmost cave. As Carl Jung describes, that which we most need will be found where we least want to look. The, the inmost cave is thus the place that we most fear to enter because it's the place where the monster of that which is not quite right resides. To come face to face with this monster is to come face to face with our shadow self, the side of our personality that contains all of the parts that we don't want to admit have. Stage eight, the great ordeal. So after making preparations and delving into the inmost cave, the hero comes face to face with the monster. I faced this monster many times. In my business, when my company almost went bankrupt and I had to trust the person I at least wanted to trust in making decisions myself. In boxing, when I stepped into the ring to face my first opponent and I had to overcome the desire to win and the fear of losing to be able to truly and freely express myself. Even with this channel, uh, clicking publish on my first video meant going to battle with the most formidable monster I've ever faced, my fear of judgment. It's important to note that sometimes we don't slay the monster on our first try. It may even initially seem impossible. However, through repeated confrontations and thus gained experience, we will eventually succeed, even if victory comes in a different form than we had anticipated. Stage nine, claiming the treasure. When we do finally defeat the monster, we get to claim its treasure, which is the weapon of sacred knowledge, forged from the most valuable material in this unknown world experience. Stage 10, the road back. So with the treasure in hand, it's now time to make our way home to the ordinary world. However, the journey is not yet complete and even greater challenges lay in wait. However, when confronting these challenges, the hero now wields their treasure, the weapon of sacred knowledge. And so with each new battle, the hero becomes more skilled in using it. Stage 11, Resurrection. Here, the hero must face what can be considered the final battle of the journey, which determines whether or not they have truly earned the right to wield the treasure that they now possess. We don't earn knowledge simply by reading something in a book, we earn it by acting on it. To know the path is not to walk the path, to walk the path is to know the path. After saving my business from bankruptcy, armed with that sacred knowledge, I now had to rebuild everything and achieve actual growth. In boxing, I'm now wielding what I learned in my first fight in the many fights that are to come. After releasing my first YouTube video, I still had to release many more YouTube videos before I could actually understand the judgments of others enough to become emotionally unaffected by them. Stage 12, return with the elixir. By overcoming the final battle of the unknown world, the hero is now worthy of the treasure, the knowledge that they believe themselves to possess. In becoming worthy, this knowledge is transformed into an elixir, which can be brought back into the ordinary world once more. Here, not only can it be used to continue to benefit the hero, but it can also now be shared for the benefits of others. All right guys, so those are the 12 stages. Uh, it's important to note that this hero's journey is not a one-time process, but rather something that if we're living an honest life, we will embark on many times <laughs> over the course of our lifetime. As Campbell puts it, what I think is a good life is one hero journey after another. Over and over again, you are called to the realm of adventure. You are called to meet horizons. Each time there is the same problem. Do I dare? We have not even to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero path. And where we have thought to find an abomination, we shall find a god. And where we have thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we have thought to travel outwards, we shall come to the center of our own existence. And where we have thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world.
Life was made up by people who are no smarter than you. If you decide to close out this video, I hope that single statement stays with you because once you truly understand it, it will shape your every single decision in life. Five years ago, I was unhappy, I was sick, and I thought this is how life had to be. The crazy thing is, I was just about ready to accept it, to let life pass by me as I sat there, alone and isolated in my little cubicle. This moment in my life was the worst and best thing that ever happened to me. It taught me the most powerful life lesson that no school and no university ever could. This is not a sponsored video and I'm not gonna try to sell you something. This is the video that I needed in my darkest days when I was working a nine to five that took the joy out of my day to day. And my only goal today is to share that lesson and how you can do the same too. But first, I need to share a piece of my story that frankly, I've avoided sharing in the past. In 2015, I started working with one of the big four accounting firms and for the first time in my life, I experienced my own form of depression. I went from being a highly driven and healthy young adult to seeing all of that change in a matter of just a few short months. I lost my drive, my ambition, to the point where getting out of bed every day became a battle. I saw the health that I had taken for granted my whole life take a complete 180 on me. I started experiencing short-term memory loss, random muscle spasms, and a twitchy eye. These weird conditions and many more all started coming on at the same time. And so naturally, I had to look for answers. After a few quick Google searches, I was convinced that I had early symptoms of MS, which is another life lesson. Don't try to diagnose yourself. So naturally, I did what everyone would do. I booked myself a doctor's appointment, but after a couple sessions of blood and urine samples, it became very apparent that on paper, I was a healthy young adult. I was strangely devastated by these findings. I wanted to be told that, oh, your this levels are off, or you're just not eating enough of that, or even take these meds, it'll make all your problems go away. Instead, my doctor told me he believed it was all stress related. And to be honest, when I heard that, I felt like that was just a feel good BS. I felt deep down inside, I had MS. Sorry, doc. From losing a loved one, relationship struggles, or exam season, I've had my fair share of normal stresses. And in all these times, it had never impacted my physical health. So I left the doctor's office and I changed absolutely nothing because I didn't really believe it, but also, I feared the idea of change. I knew mentally I wasn't in the best place since starting that new job, but I feared giving up that prestigious title and the future opportunities that I would be abandoning. I feared what my parents and friends would say, and I especially feared leaving my job only to fail. And so I stayed put. A few weeks went by and I continued going to work, feeling miserable and seeing new health problems spring up. It became my new normal and it sucked. After three months grinding away at the firm and seeing all my dreams go by the wayside, I realized in that moment I had to make a decision. Either go and find a new job that's more in line with who I was as a person or what I really wanted to do, take the time to wholeheartedly pursue my own passions and projects. The problem was I was broke and I didn't know how to make money with my passions and I barely even knew what my passions were at the time. I also didn't have anyone in my life who encouraged me to do something so bold. In fact, my parents, my friends encouraged me to stay at the firm, telling me things like, don't worry, it will get better. Soon you'll be promoted and you'll be able to do what you love. These are the responses we've all heard to make the most of a shitty situation. But I asked myself one question that gave me sudden clarity. Does anyone in this office have a life that I aspire to live? For that matter, does anybody in a nine to five lifestyle have a life that I aspire to live? And the answer was simply no. This is when my life changed. I still had no money, a ton of fear and mental hurdles, no concrete plans, but the decision had never become so easy. On November 15, 2015, I handed in my resignation. The moment that I quit, it was like the flick of a light switch. My smile came back. My motivation was at an all-time high, and my health problems disappeared like magic. Turns out, my doctor was right. I truly underestimated the importance of mental health. After handing in my resignation, I called my parents. They were shocked and a little disappointed. I called my landlord, and I was super lucky because he only charged me a small premium for canceling my contract early. And my third phone call was to my buddy Brom who at the time was working as a general contractor. And just like that, he was able to get me a flexible part-time job that enabled me to set my own hours and make 17 Canadian dollars an hour. Almost the following day, I was back to work. 
From Monday to Wednesday, I would work 12 hour days helping set up a Best Buy as a general laborer. And from Thursday to Sunday, that's where the real work happened, building the early Lost LeBlanc business. I would spend morning to night teaching myself how to edit, researching my upcoming travel plans, and I even began pitching my humble little channel to camera brands in hopes they would buy into my story and loan me the camera gear I could never afford to buy. I truly discovered my secret power, and that was determination fueled by passion. In just 30 days, I was able to buy my one-way ticket from Vancouver to Bangkok, Thailand. I was able to take my bank account from being nearly empty to having 2,500 US on reserve. And I had landed an agreement with Panasonic, and they sent me a GH4 and a lens with basically no strings attached. And my parents even started to get on board as they saw how hard I was working and that this was truly my passion. But most of all, I had never been happier in my life. After just three months on the road, I had my first break-even month, meaning that my expenses were completely paid off by my revenue. In year one, I was able to make a modest profit of $10,000 by keeping my costs low, knocking on hostile doors, cold calling tour operators, and finding any other way that I could to make money and save money. In year number three, I had my first six-figure annual income, and in year four, I had achieved over $1 million in revenue. And after five years, I went from creating travel content to now teaching well over a thousand other creators how to become their own bosses. Every door I've ever wanted open has swung open. Am I just lucky? Well, here's the reason I really made this video. Odds are really good you can relate to where I was. Working a job that you don't love and knowing that there's so much more to life, but being pressured into sticking to the status quo. This is how most people will live their entire lives. The greatest discovery of my 27 years on this planet is something that I am so fortunate to have learned early on in life. It's something that I wasn't taught, but it is the number one thing that I will teach to my children and anyone I get to know closely. And that is, what you believe is what you will achieve. In other words, your state of mind determines your finish line. Yeah, I spent like 15 minutes coming up with that. Simply put, we define our own limits by what we believe. The problem is, most of us, including myself, are not taught how capable we really are. And so we abandon our dreams and set boundaries that lack ambition. We are told to be successful, we have to go to school, find a stable nine to five, and then in time, retire. But the crazy thing is, we're not told to find a career we actually love. We're told that nine out of 10 businesses fail, but nobody tells us what it takes to be that one out of 10. We are told that it takes luck to be successful, but nobody talks about the fact that you can make your own luck. Now, the good news. We all have that ability to train and unlock a mindset that makes us truly unstoppable. A mindset that's so powerful that failure becomes completely out of the equation. Now, one thing I need to say is there's absolutely nothing wrong with working nine to five. The problem is compromise. Before building out Lost LeBlanc, I had maybe worked seven or eight jobs, and every single time, it felt like I was sacrificing a piece of me just to be able to make a bit of money so that I could get by. On Mondays, I was constantly thinking about Saturday. In November, as things got rainy and gloomy, I was dreaming what I would do with my two weeks off in June. Constantly looking to the future and never living in the moment only exasperated my unhappiness. My early jobs made me think that all careers would be like this. And so I just had to find the one that sucked the least. But a shocking discovery that I had was that it was possible to have just as much, if not even more joy in my days at work than on my days off. I want that for you. You're going to be spending majority of your best years working in that career, in that field. So why not make sure it's something that you love? something that brings you joy and happiness, and something you would do even if nobody was paying you to do it. Your dream career is out there, but nobody's gonna give it to you. You have to go out there and take it for yourself. And to do that, you're going to need an unstoppable mindset. Being unstoppable means learning to push forward even when you're dealt a shitty hand. It means pressing onward even when the world tells you to turn back. And it means holding on to your dreams even when you start to question yourself. Identifying these passions is crucial because when you do what you love, you'll be able to withstand the upcoming challenges and they're bound to happen. Today, you might not even know what those passions are. I didn't know what mine were until I actually went out there and did them. So in all honesty, you might start off by reaching for the wrong thing. But just remember, that is part of the journey. 
ups and downs, and even sometimes taking wrong turns. But as long as you are moving, eventually you will be moving in the right direction. Secondly, you need to reach for a goal that scares you. If it doesn't scare you, it's because you're not pushing hard enough. Your goal is not yet ambitious enough. Fear is the number one indicator that what you're reaching for is great. So lean into the fear and remember what's waiting on the other side. And lastly, you must protect your mindset. So be careful who you spend your time with and be even more careful who you take your advice from. Mentors are great, but information is only as good as the source. Ask yourself if the advice you seek is coming from a person who has already achieved what it is you seek to achieve yourself. Now, you might be asking yourself, what if I fail? I remember I used to get asked all the time, Christian, what are you gonna do when your channel stops getting watched? As if that was my only lifeline. When I started my journey, I had no film experience, but today I get contacted to shoot six-figure campaigns and commercials. When I first started, I had no idea how e-commerce worked, but today I have a thriving content creator academy, I sell travel guides online, and I could easily make a living teaching others how to do the same. When I started, I had no connections and no idea what I was doing, but today I have more promising business ideas than I know what to do with. If Lost LeBlanc becomes irrelevant, or if it had never even been relevant in the first place, I would still have so many avenues to turn this so-called failure into a wild success. Your thing might not be travel or content creation, but whether you want to open up that yoga studio or take your personal training online, embrace the journey. It might not take you exactly where you think it will, but that's only because your end destination will be even greater than you imagined. Do not feel sentenced to a nine to five that you don't want. It is impossible to fail when you wholeheartedly commit to the unknown. And lastly, this is directed at you. Do not wait for the perfect moment because the perfect moment simply doesn't exist. The only thing we have guaranteed is today, make it count. Life was made up by people who are no smarter than you and I, so, Let's write our own rules. I am an introvert, and I love it. And I'm not alone. Introverts are everywhere. And our quiet approach to life, our need for solitary time, isn't a flaw. It's a gift. But as an introvert, it's not always easy to realize how wonderful you are. The world feels like a place that rewards extroverts. Where being loud is mistaken for being confident and happy. Where everyone has something to say, but nobody listens. A world of open plan offices, networking parties, and big personalities. For those who speak softly, it's easy to feel left out. As a child, I blended into the background. Many thought that I had little to say or that I simply didn't like others, but that wasn't true. People often think introverts are shy or antisocial, but these are misconceptions. Introverts like anyone can find socializing fun, but while parties leave extroverts energized, after some time, introverts need to recharge away from everyone. There's a scientific theory for this. There are two important chemicals found in all our brains, dopamine and acetylcholine. Dopamine is like a hit of energy when we take risks or meet new people, and it makes extroverts feel great. But introverts are more sensitive to dopamine and get quickly overstimulated. That's why we prefer the more slow burn feeling we get when our brains release acetylcholine. That happens when we concentrate, read, or focus our minds. It makes us introverts feel relaxed, alert, and content. But it barely registers with extroverts. Of course, like anything, it's a sliding scale. You can lean one way or another, or be a bit of both, known as an ambivert. Now I understand myself better. I am deeply grateful for how I am. Instead of filling up space with small talk, I listen patiently and make my words matter. I have few friends, but our connection is deep. I love spending time alone. It's where the chaos of a long day can finally settle 
I can reflect and listen to my thoughts and eventually reconnect with myself. Only after that am I ready to share with the world again. I've learned strategies for finding comfort in our noisy world. From using music to create bubbles of peace, to escaping to a quiet park at lunchtime. I adore the intensity and chaotic beauty of the world, but it's in quiet spaces where I feel truly at home. If introversion were more valued by society, it could make a massive difference to our collective future. The unique attributes of introverts really are a deep, quiet strength. And as Gandhi put it, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications for new videos. See you again soon. When you arise in the morning, think of what a precious privilege it is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love. The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Look well into thyself. There is a source of strength which will always spring up as thou wilt always look. Do not indulge in dreams of having what you have not, but reckon up the chief of the blessings you do possess, and then thankfully remember how you would crave them if they were not yours. The object of life is not to be on the side of the majority, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. Here is a rule to remember in future when anything tempts you to feel bitter. Not, this is misfortune, but to bear this worthily is good fortune. Accept whatever comes to you woven in the pattern of your destiny, for what could more aptly fit your needs? You don't have to turn this into something. It doesn't have to upset you. To live a good life, we all have the potential for it if we learn to be indifferent to what makes no difference. Think of yourself as dead. You have lived your life. Now, take what's left and live it properly. Death smiles at us all, but all a man can do is smile back. The best revenge is not to be like your enemy, your mind will take the shape of what you frequently hold in thought, for the human spirit is colored by such impressions. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. It is not death that a man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live. Never let the future disturb you. You will meet it, if you have to, with the same weapons of reason which today arm you against the present. Very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself in your way of thinking. Loss is nothing else but change, and change is nature's delight. A man's true delight is to do the things he was made for.
True happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future. Not to amuse ourselves with either hopes or fears, but to rest satisfied with what we have, which is sufficient. For he that is so wants nothing. Begin at once to live and count each separate day as a separate life. It is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that things are difficult. We all sorely complain of the shortness of time and yet have much more than we know what to do with. Our lives are either spent in doing nothing at all or in doing nothing to the purpose or in doing nothing that we ought to do. We are always complaining that our days are few and acting as though there would be no end of them. A gem cannot be polished without friction nor a man perfected without trials. The bravest sight in the world is to see a great man struggling against adversity. Every night, before going to sleep, we must ask ourselves, what weakness did I overcome today? What virtue did I acquire? Throw me to the wolves, and I will return leading the pack. Life is never incomplete if it is an honorable one. At whatever point you leave life, if you leave it in the right way, it is whole. We suffer more often in imagination than in reality. You want to live, but do you know how to live? You are scared of dying, but tell me, is the kind of life you lead really any different to being dead? The greatest blessings of mankind are within us and within our reach. A wise man is contented with his lot, whatever it may be. Man is affected not by events, but by the view he takes of them. As is a tale, so is life. Not how long it is, but how good it is, is what matters. Sometimes, even to live is an act of courage. If you really want to escape the things that harass you, what you're needing is not to be in a different place, but to be a different person. Until we have begun to go without them, we fail to realize how unnecessary many things are. We've been using them not because we needed them, but because we had them. He suffers more than necessary, who suffers before it is necessary. Hang on to your youthful enthusiasms. You'll be able to use them better when you are older. It is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more that is poor. If a man knows not to which port he sails, no wind is favorable. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. From this instant on, vow to stop disappointing yourself. Separate yourself from the mob Decide to be extraordinary and do what you need to do now. What ought one to say then as each hardship comes? I was practicing for this. I was training for this. Fortify yourself with moderation, for this is an impenetrable fortress. 
If you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid. No great thing is created suddenly any more than a bunch of grapes or a fig. If you tell me that you desire a fig, I will answer that there must be time. Let it first blossom, then bear fruit, then ripen. First, say to yourself what you would be, and then do what you have to do. When you are offended at any man's fault, turn to yourself and study your own failings. Then you will forget your anger. The trials you encounter will introduce you to your strengths. Remain steadfast, and one day you will build something that endures, something worthy of your potential. The world turns aside to let any man pass who knows where he is going. Attach yourself to what is spiritually superior regardless of what other people think or do. Hold to your true aspirations, no matter what is going on around you. You may fetter my leg, but Zeus himself cannot get the better of my free will. Seek not the good in external things, seek it in yourselves. On the occasion of every accident that befalls you, remember to turn to yourself and inquire what power you have for turning it to use. It is the nature of the wise to resist pleasures, but the foolish to be a slave to them. Caretake this moment, immerse yourself in its particulars, Respond to this person, this challenge, this deed. Quit evasions. Stop giving yourself needless trouble. It is time to really live. If you want to be a writer, write. The key is to keep company only with people who uplift you, whose presence calls forth your best. Be discriminating about what images and ideas you permit into your mind. No man is free who is not a master of himself. If anyone tells you that a certain person speaks ill of you, do not make excuses about what is said of you, but answer. He was ignorant of my other faults, else he would not have mentioned these alone. It is impossible to begin to learn that which one thinks one already knows. Do not seek to have events happen as you wish, but wish them to happen as they do happen, and all will be well with you. Never depend on the admiration of others. There is no strength in it. Personal merit cannot be derived from an external source. Nobody cares about when you do that and there's like muscles there. Nobody cares about that. <laughs> If 